Additive manufacturing is technology turning manufacturing on its head. It's a smarter, faster way to produce. Perfect for a small, ultra-efficient Singapore. Additive manufacturing in Singapore is spearheading industries like biomedical, design and building construction, precision engineering, electronics, aerospace and marine offshore, as well as clean technology. What we're working on is developing new materials, new ways of printing and designing these materials to suit your body part, and then training the doctors to put them back into your body. EM can be used to make injection molds with conformal cooling channels, as well as low volume customized jigs and fixtures. We have already seen a uh, door brackets which has been 3D printed and have been used in the aeroplanes. We will also see fuel nozzles that will be used in the aircraft engines. So an exciting development is uh, development of hybrid technologies. This is a combination of both additive and subtractive based technologies, such as milling. Solar panel and wind turbine uh, are some of the emerging applications uh, with EM in the clean technology sector. The water membrane is another uh, very exciting area that's coming through. Additive manufacturing is a huge area of growth for the future, along with uh, robotics and automation. Uh, in Budget 2016, uh, the government announced uh, the Industry Transformation Program. Additive manufacturing, automation, sensors, analytics, uh, these will be the enablers. AM is identified as a disruptive technology that has the power to impact lives, businesses, and global economy. It is a game changer. The current market size is about 7 billion and we should see the, this number tripled by the year 2020 to 21 billion. The AM ecosystem as we see it is made out of three main parts. Universities that are training students for working in the 3D industries and do research in corporations that do prototyping work, actual parts and scale down model to train people and individuals that take advantage of the fact that 3D can do small quantity productions. It's critical selecting the right applications that are technically feasible and economically viable, then having a workforce um, that is able to collaborate and innovate to create the new applications and solve the challenges. We want to help companies translate their technologies into viable commercial solutions. We do this by partnerships, seeding capabilities, and skills training to position them well into the next industrial revolution. If you are interested to know more about AM and the new wave that's coming, come talk to us today. The NUS Center for Additive Manufacturing explores a whole new dimension in medicine, adopting the use of 3D printing technology and an unprecedented level of multidisciplinary collaboration in every step of the healthcare chain. It's a fresh new approach that leverages the university's world-class faculties, combining perspectives from all the disciplines to achieve a whole new level of personalization in healthcare. And this includes expertise from faculty members of dentistry, design, engineering, medicine, and science. At the Engineering Center's cluster, we are equipped with advanced 3D printing facilities, including metal, polymer, plastics, electronic, and ceramic printers ideal for applications in biomedical and precision engineering. Currently, our main applications are personalized medicine, implantables, and anatomically accurate models for educational purposes. This is a knee implant printed by a metal printer in the lab. Surgeons and patients will have a chance to review the details in 3D before printing the actual implant. Using actual scan of the patient body parts, we have the ability to make realistic models for medical students and professionals to practice their surgical skills and pre-plan operations. Future generations of dentists and doctors are going to be better educated right from the start. 3D printed simulation models of human anatomy provide realistic visual and touch context to enhance learning of operative skills and knowledge. We are using 3D printing technology 
in all aspects of medical applications, including printing of tissue replacements and customized prostheses. It's incredibly complex, but with the biological expertise from our clinicians and scientists, together with a deep understanding of 3D printing from our engineers, these advances are moving ever closer to the treatment table. 3D printing technology allows pharmaceutical scientists to fabricate individualized drug dosing according to the needs of patients. We are making the practice of personalized medicines real and revolutionizing pharmaceutical care today. Every project is a collaboration with industry, clinicians, engineers and designers who all bring their own unique perspectives to address complex issues that cannot be solved alone. Imagine what you could do with the right people who have the right information and the right technology. We help companies adopt additive manufacturing to make their products and processes better and more cost-effective. Come work with us and discover a wealth of expertise at am.nus. Good morning to all of you joining us from all around the world for this third 3D Heals NAMIC Healthcare 3D Printing Forum. Coming to you live right here from Singapore. We thank you for joining us this morning, especially on a Saturday morning. We hope uh, we have put together 
a stellar lineup of speakers from the United States, where 3D Hills is actually based, and experts right here from Singapore for you. Brought to you by 3D Hills, NAMIC, and co-organized with AM.NUS, we invite you to sit back, get your cuppa, just like me, and join us uh, in listening to many speakers and who will be taking you on several journeys into how 3D printing is shaping our healthcare today. You will hear from passionate speakers, innovators, and medical practitioners who are making significant impacts to better our lives through 3D printing. We hope to intrigue you, inform you, awaken your senses, invoke your curiosity, inspire your inquisitive minds, and most of all, invite all of you to come together in our pursuit for excellence for a better future with 3D printing for you and our families. It's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Ho Cho Singh, the Managing Director of the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Cluster, also fondly known to the industry as NAMIC, to kick off today's proceedings with his welcome address. Dr. Ho, please. Very good morning and a good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome again to the uh, Treaty Hills NAMIC Healthcare 3D Printing Forum. Uh, thank you for all making time uh, on a Saturday morning if you're in the Asia time zone and Friday evening if you're in the US time zone to attend this. Uh, we're very fortunate and very pleased to have uh, Dr. Jenny Chern, founder CEO of 3D Hills with us today. And as what Mandarin has mentioned, this is actually our third time uh, co-hosting this forum together with 3D Hills. Uh, this year's edition has changed significantly from the previous three editions of our summit which were traditionally held uh, at the National University of Singapore since uh, 2018. Uh, naturally, the changes are in response to the COVID-19 imposed travel restrictions in place throughout the world in one form or another. Uh, I was just told that uh, this morning that we have uh, about uh, 400 over attendees, uh, or at least registrations uh, to this forum. It's probably the, the most number that we've ever had in the, in the uh, past three editions. Um, I thought that before I hand it over to Jenny and our distinguished speakers, I thought we could, I could spend a minute framing the current world context of what, where we are today. Um, I think the world ahead is uh, extremely challenging. Uh, we have uh, geopolitical tensions uh, coupled with changes uh, to deep set habits caused by the pandemic, uh, which obviously would inevitably cause changes to the way we make, consume, recycle, or upcycle. And all of this, uh, whichever industries you're in, will continue need to, to be to constantly reinvent and evolve to stay relevant and in business. Um, so businesses, whether in healthcare, education, supply chains, or even deep tech, uh, will also be increasingly more interlinked and connected through the adoption of new technologies. And this is something that we foresee that will continue to gain momentum. Uh, 3D printing has actually played a very important role uh, in enabling new paradigms in rapid medical supplies development and deployment with on-demand high volume manufacturing. Uh, I want to end this uh, message uh, briefly just to also thank the team who has worked uh, very hard behind the scenes to bring this event to all of you, uh, Mahendran, Willin Ng, and Lin Lim. With that, and without further ado, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you once again, and I'll hand it back to Mahendran. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ho, and I think a special mention also goes to the team from AM.NUS, Dr. Wee and team who will also be working very, very hard for this. So um, now it's my pleasure to introduce this special person. She is the practicing radiologist in California, inspiring global entrepreneur and the founder of the 3D Heals Global Network. Extremely pleasant person and a highly focused business leader, tremendously resourceful, super passionate about 3D printing, having invested her time, finance and resources in building 3D Heals. To give us a macro perspective on healthcare 3D printing, here is Dr. Jenny Chen. Hi, good morning and good evening, everyone. Let me just uh, push this button so I can get on to Instagram. Um, hold on one sec, let me just get the tech ready. Um, First of all, I want to thank Dr. Ho and Mahandre for, and, and everyone else uh, at NAMIC and NUS to make this happen. It's really 
the honor and pleasure to be able to visit Singapore and meet all the individuals, influencers uh, in healthcare 3D printing every year in Singapore, except for this year, unfortunately, uh, obviously. Um, so the passion that I have for healthcare 3D printing started more than five years ago when I first um, touched a 3D printed anatomical model and I think the world really changed for me. And uh, since then, I really want to make a bigger impact beyond my regular daily practice and explore this technology. Um, and so I founded 3D Heals about five years ago with the intention of creating a network um, with individuals who are passionate for healthcare 3D printing, bioprinting, and related technologies. So over the years, 3D Heals mission has crystallized and we focus on three things. First is to connect people, and we're quite good and efficient about it. Uh, we host events and we make one-on-one -on -one, uh, introductions. And two is we like to educate people better. Um, as you know, years ago, uh, right around you know five, six years ago when I just started 3D Hills, the education is not super formalized. And I think over the time, you know, especially in Singapore, the education um, aspect of 3D printing healthcare has really built up since then. So we want to continue to be able to deliver high quality content from experts in the field to the public about what 3D printing can do in healthcare, either anatomical model, implants to bioprinted tissues. And finally, and is, this is, a, you know, I think there's more and more emphasis on this point is discover startups and innovators so that we can really make more meaningful impact in the innovation aspect of this field to provide mentorship, make connections for these startups and innovators, and finally funding them. So I think many people who are speakers today and many people who are join, joining this forum today probably share a common vision that 3D printing will transform healthcare in a very significant way. I mean, the kind of healthcare anywhere that we really hope for is a care that is very accessible and is personalized, is higher quality, but less cost. Um, and I believe 3D printing can really um, make an impact in all aspects of this future, hopefully better healthcare delivery system. Um, so in the last five years, really organically, our community has really grown. 3D Halo's community has grown from one city in San Francisco, which is hosted by me, and then just kind of by all these volunteers who are passionate about the technology, um, uh, from all over the world. So we ended up with like 20 communities um, all over the world and we host events all over the world. And Singapore is definitely uh, one of our best partners uh, among the communities. So this is just a list of the events that we did. Um, you know, we were gonna have a large in-person conference this year in June, but unfortunately, as you know, that didn't happen. But instead, we were able to congregate 77 speakers online, which is a crazy endeavor, um, 22 hours of webinar, <laughs> two days, but everybody showed up. And that to me is uh, very touching because I feel like the community really delivered and showed up when they're needed. And people are still really looking forward to connect, to innovate, and, you know, and, and partner up. Um, other things that we have executed in the last year is we really built up the expert corner block section where we invite um, first author of papers, uh, founders of companies, and key, pe uh, key personnel in organizations to write first person uh, articles for us. So we don't really want any journalists to quote. We invite people who are in the trenches doing the work to um, tell their own story. And we will do more of similar content in the future. And another thing that we worked really hard in the last couple of years is we started to have this more regular online pitch where pre-seed, seed, or early stage companies in general in the field uh, would present to a group of institutional investors. So it's not just me, uh, I'm an angel investor, but institutional investors who can potentially fund them with deeper pocket, let's just say that. So we, we want to spend more time and energy in the coming year to really build up this pitch platform. 
So that's where, uh, that's where we are in terms of what 3D Heals is and where we are and what we want to do in the next couple of years. And again, I really appreciate the invitation to this platform to continue to connect with Singapore because it is a very, well, one is my favorite country uh, and two is such an important uh, country from geopolitical economic perspective. And I actually wrote a skeleton of a guide to Singapore today in the last 24 hours to put together some information. Um, and I, I really do believe people should know about Singapore and Singapore's uh, healthcare 3D printing ecosystem. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, we are really looking forward to seeing that piece that you've been working on. I think you've been putting a lot of effort into that as well. So it's not just the last 24 hours. I think you've been following what's going on in Singapore for the last three years. And you know, every time you come here, it gives us a, a, a bit of boost of energy and, uh, and all the uh, knowledge that you bring to us and the networking that happens uh, during 3D Heals is amazing. So thanks so much for that, that contribution. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Gavin O'Neill. He's a senior consultant at the Division of Musculoskeletal Trauma Division of Hip and Knee Surgery, Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the National University Hospital. He's also a thrust lead in NUS Center for Additive Manufacturing, AM.NUS, a 3D printing R&D hub that is pushing the frontiers of 3D printing in various sectors, including healthcare. He specializes in all aspects of musculoskeletal trauma, particular interest in complex periarticular trauma and periprosthetic fractures and pelvic and epitabular trauma. His significant experience in computer-assisted surgery, sports surgery, and hip arthroscopy. He's very committed to the ongoing education of pre- and postgraduate students at NUHS, uh, at, at NUS, and, and at NUHS as well, and he's a core faculty member. Kevin, it's my pleasure to invite you to speak about 3D printing application and capabilities in orthopedics. Kevin, take it away. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we see your Great. screen. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gavin O'Neill. I'm uh, an orthopedic consultant at the uh, National University Hospital in Singapore. Um, I'm speaking today, just as uh, Mahendran has said, in my role as the thrust lead for the Center of Additive Manufacturing at the School of Medicine. Um, I'm really going to talk about uh, the 3D printing capabilities uh, and applications in orthopedics. Uh, what we can offer at the Center of Additive uh, Manufacturing at the NUS and uh, how we can uh, partner with uh, many of you today in the audience uh, to try and take your ideas uh, forward to fruition. So um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the additive manufacturing uh, uh, environment has been uh, ongoing for some time. It's a very mature industry and the technology is incredibly advanced and it's no longer seen as a, a novel or new technology. Um, it started uh, in the 1980s with uh, an orthopedics uh, with uh, trying to solve uh, difficult uh, problems which our current implants and uh, devices could not uh, deal with. Uh, large bone defects, uh, defects that were unreconstructable using the current devices that we had. Uh, it was led by a small number of uh, uh, very uh, devoted and uh, enthusiastic uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons. Uh, over the years this has uh, developed uh, into the so-called low-hanging fruit of the last uh, 10 years or so, where people have moved away from uh, implantable devices and focused really on external non-implantable devices, uh, uh, ankle foot orthoses, uh, cutting jigs for malunited fractures, uh, deformity correction and post-trauma complications. This has become the norm in many, many areas in orthopedics and is a service that's provided uh, by uh, many uh, companies. The big change really has been in the last five years where uh, devices that we would normally have uh, manufactured uh, through standard techniques have really, uh, uh, there's been a, a significant shift in the manufacturing of these devices to uh, uh, standard uh, devices and off the shelf devices being uh, uh, manufactured using additive uh, techniques. Many of the large multinationals now use this uh, as part of their uh, routine manufacturing processes. You can see in the images on the top left, these are tibial base plates, acetabular uh, cups, and spinal fusion cages. They have gone from uh, standard manufacturing techniques to now being produced uh, en masse by large multinational companies. Many of the surgeons uh, implanting them are not aware that they are actually being manufactured using uh, additive uh, techniques. 
uh, I think many of the subsequent speakers, uh, Dr. Dang, etc., will tell us a bit more about how this industry has evolved uh, to become the norm in the production of these devices. And this is really where the focus is, uh, I think, in terms of uh, the orthopedic world as to how to bring uh, the technology and the ideas to the mass market. So what is the current situation really with the medical devices? The multinationals really are investing very heavily in this. They see clean manufacturing as uh, the way forward. Uh, they see a minimal inventory and a short lead time to production and the cost savings that they can have from the, the overall logistics and supply chain are very significant. And it's really how the clinical environment and clinicians can be involved in that process that will really make it uh, come to fruition and, and be realized uh, in the coming years. The big move really, and it's something we are involved in very heavily at NUS, is point of care manufacturing. Uh, point of care manufacturing is manufacturing close to the point of the, the implant and device being used in the large uh, hospital setting, uh, large university hospitals. This could be uh, on site. And indeed, at NUH, we're working towards uh, having facilities such as that. Uh, for smaller uh, general and regional hospitals, there may be a uh, local, uh, regional or country-based manufacturing uh, uh, environment, which can allow printing, uh, design and development uh, close to the healthcare facility. It's a very exciting and, and uh, changing time in the development of these devices and in particular the production and the processes around that uh, system, which uh, allow for many of uh, you clinicians uh, out there with good ideas, uh, especially uh, not just devices, but in the processes and how to link up uh, the IT systems uh, and the flow of that to make it uh, realized and to shorten the lead time from uh, admission, uh, scanning, uh, development of the device, refinement of that device and printing uh, in the clinical setting. Uh, I've been very fortunate myself to work across many of the different areas in relation to orthopedics. Uh, we've extensive experience in the educational models. We use these uh, routinely to teach our residents uh, complex injuries and fractures, uh, in particular acetabular injuries and fractures, these are complex fractures that are very difficult for them to conceptualize. Uh, it helps them understand the anatomy of the fracture, uh, understand the surgical approaches they need to use and the treatment algorithms for these complex injuries. As mentioned already, we use them extensively for surgical planning in deformity correction, the treatment of malunited injuries and areas where there's musculoskeletal tumor problems and large bone loss and from that. We've been very fortunate to be involved with some of the large multinationals in doing feasibility studies for the point of care model. We've shown that it's feasible for someone to be admitted to hospital, have all their imaging done, the design of the implants done and the printing done all within 24 hours. And we're working closely with some of these companies now to try and realize that in the true clinical setting on site in the hospital. We've also got many partners uh, in the other IHLs within Singapore and I've done many FEA studies, in, particularly in the area that I'm uh, very keen on in orthopedic trauma uh, with our colleagues at SIT. To just give you a little bit of an insight to what we do ourselves in my particular area of interest, um, it's really to do with fracture treatment and the healing rates and the capabilities of the devices that we currently use. They've been on the market for a long time and really have remained static for many, many decades. There have been some refinements and slight improvements over the years, but nothing very significant. So we see this opportunity of additive manufacturing and the capabilities that, it, that that brings with it to use different designs and concepts to try and improve not just the functionality of the plates, but the bi biomechanical environment and healing, and hopefully the rate of healing, speed of healing, quality of healing, and ultimately the outcome for the patients. To start off with, we used very simple lattice uh, classic designs and showed even with this very simple step that you can significantly improve the performance of these devices both in the lab uh, and in the clinical environment. Very fortunately with some of our uh, colleagues and collaborators at NUS in particular with Prof uh, Thalamer, uh, he has designed and developed and allowed us to use many of his large bank of biomimetic structures these have taken the design and development of the implants onto the next level where we can truly try to match the biological environment using metals 
and the additive manufacturing techniques. I've been very fortunate to take this process all the way from conceptual design through bench testing and all the way through to animal testing, which we'll be conducting in the coming uh, months. So it's a very exciting time for us. We see this as a, a significant uh, change in the way we look at and treat these types of fractures and injuries. And we see this uh, percolating into many other areas of orthopedics. At NUS and the lab itself, we have an extensive array of printers, everything from low, mid and high range polymer printers through to a full suite of cell printers, right to ceramic, ceramic composite, stainless steel and titanium printers. We also have extensive post-processing uh, facilities, which whenever we start to deal with lattices, we find to be the biggest problem. So we've done extensive work and research, both in-house with our uh, colleagues and also with ASTAR and Simtech to really try and bring all this post-processing and difficult time-consuming process into the manufacturing suite itself and try to incorporate this into one system to shorten lead time and to really make the feasibility of this becoming a true clinical possibility. So what's next really for us at am.nus? We really see the center as a seamless pathway from development to regulatory approval. You can join this pathway at any stage. If you've got new novel ideas, we can help you foster those. We can put you in touch with the correct people, designers, engineers, local, small and medium sized enterprises and the large multinationals to really take the design and development to the next stage. We can use our in-house skills and equipment to help you do prototyping, testing, cell testing, and even animal testing to really try and bring this to market. We can help you at the later stages, partner with our external uh, industry partners to take the designs, development, and implants uh, to the clinical environment. So essentially, we really want you to come and visit us. We want you to uh, come see what our facilities are, what we can offer, uh, the skills and experiences built up over the past five years through the help of uh, NAMIC and uh, the 3D Heels and the wider clinical community. We're very much open to dealing and helping uh, anyone from our own cluster, the other healthcare clusters, industry, medical, non-medical and other IHLs to really work in this collaborative environment to take the final step and make additive manufacturing and 3D printing a, real, a realistic approach to, to the treatment of all our patients on a daily basis. So if you want to do that, you can come and connect with us in all the usual ways. Our key points of contact are Ui and Wei Che at the Center for Additive Manufacturing. And you can also join us at our website, am.nus.edu.sg. And you can come and meet us, visit the center. We're very happy to uh, take all inquiries and to really help you collaborate within the wider Singapore community and global community to really take your ideas to the next step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gavin O'Neill. Thank you so much. I think just like, uh, just to reiterate what uh, Gavin was sharing, and that NUS is really leading the space here and uh, there's a lot of work going on. So kindly speak with us, our team, and also our hub managers there, uh, Dr. Wee, who is there, uh, and respond in all these various uh, ways of uh, connecting with them to bring your ideas and your thoughts and how we can together grow this space. Next, um, it's a special feature that we have here. I mean, we've heard from Dr. Ho, uh, Jenny, and as well as, um, Gavin was part of the organizing committee. And we were just, you know, we are in very, very interesting times now. Uh, and we are all responding to it in different ways. And I'm not, I'm talking about the global pandemic that has kind of crippled us and almost come brought us to this stage where we are doing this event even live uh, for you virtually instead of having it in person. So how are we responding to the global pandemic? Um, to talk more about this is uh, Dr. David Allen. He's the Associate Vice President, Health Innovation and Translation at the National University Hospital. Very acclaimed, with many years of experience. In the, he's an infectious disease specialist, consultant at the Division of Infectious Disease uh, at the National University Hospital. And he's also the Associate Professor, Yong, Lu, Yong Lulin School of Medicine, NUS. He has been an integral member of the nasopharyngeal swaps team that was swiftly assembled in a short period of time 
in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, comprising of many key players from the industry, research, academia, clinicians, working together with the team in NAMIC as well. Let's hear now from Dr. David Allen's account of the NP swap team that stepped up to the COVID-19 challenge. David. Thank you, Mahendran, uh, and uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Uh, let me share my screen with you, if I may. And uh, off we go. My experience uh, with uh, 3D printing has uh, extended uh, prior to uh, most recent uh, events uh, associated with the uh, issue I'm going to speak to you about uh, today. Uh, I've been uh, an infectious disease physician, have a very active practice in uh, uh, infectious disease, particularly in uh, those associated with uh, complex orthopedic infections. So uh, Gavin's uh, discussion is uh, right at home for me. Uh, we've been dealing with uh, 3D printed uh, uh, pelvises for uh, uh, people who've had osteosarcomas and uh, other complex uh, orthopedic issues for a long time. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to see this field uh, evolving. So what I'm going to speak to you today, uh, this morning about is a uh, very pragmatic uh, utilization of 3D printing. Um, uh, let me just uh, quickly talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics. There's a variety of ways we can diagnose people. Uh, you'll see the nucleic acid detection PCR. That's pretty much the gold standard. It has its limitations, um, but that is the gold standard uh, and uh, continues to be so. Um, there are a variety of other methods of doing so, uh, but I won't uh, speak to them other than I'm a big fan of the bottom one, the volatile organic compound detection, uh, particularly using uh, dogs. Um, and they deploy this in uh, the airport in Dubai. They uh, have you swab your, your armpit, uh, they put it in a jar, and then they have the dog sniff it, and the dog is, uh, has greater than 90% sensitivity uh, at being able to detect someone with uh, COVID-19, and they can do so within a second. And obviously the cost of test is merely a biscuit or a, rub, a tummy rub, so that's kind of nice. Uh, these are uh, the different ways we, uh, and timing of when we can find evidence that the virus is present, either by culturing it or by antibody or by more likely doing the PCR. And uh, this is not meant to be gone through in detail. It's just meant to show you there's a finite window in when we could diagnose people um, and what tests to deploy at that time. Again, the, the take home message is the uh, nasopharyngeal PCR up until this point has been the gold standard. And uh, this is how you do it. You pass the swab through the nose uh, to the back of the throat, uh, uh, transiting some uh, relatively complex and narrow uh, passages uh, to get to the back of the throat so that you can sample the specimen, which will find remnants or portions of the virus present. So these uh, were the FDA approved uh, uh, manufacturers uh, that were uh, the main players. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Uh, Puritan and uh, Copan, uh, as well as Beckton Dickinson being the, the, the bigger ones. The other ones are smaller uh, participants. Uh, and Copan was the brand that was uh, primarily used in Singapore. And if you look there, you can see it's in uh, Italy. And the portion of Italy it was in was the portion that was most uh, uh, heavily hit um, by the pandemic, uh, the first wave that they had in Italy. So the plant was compromised and the demand was exploding um, and therefore supply became a problem. Uh, and this became apparent in, in March and continued. Um, and you can see some of the, the headlines uh, emphasizing that point. So um, in Singapore, uh, we had some lead uh, on how to deal with this pandemic informed by experience with SARS uh, back in 2003. Um, we, had, uh, uh, we had 238 cases, unfortunately 97 with her in healthcare workers and a total of 33 deaths. Um, it taught Singapore, taught us how to maintain and main, uh, keep a strong working relationship between various sectors uh, that could respond. We learned to stockpile medical equipment, supplies and medication, and obviously do scenario planning. The stockpiling of medical equipment helped us. So 
in late March, um, we were asked to support uh, some regional uh, medical uh, equipment requests, uh, medical equipment supply requests. Uh, and in the process of doing so and analyzing what the situation was, we realized that while we had stockpiled swabs um, in advance, uh, this thing was going to last longer than we all anticipated, or at least initially planned for, and therefore uh, our stockpiles would be tested. Uh, we rapidly communicated uh, with other uh, interested parties globally as to what steps they were taking to find out if there were some preset means of addressing a shortage in nasal pharyngeal swabs. Um, it turns out there was an enormous amount of uh, basic science published on this. Uh, there was proprietary information that the manufacturers held that they weren't necessarily eager to share. Um, and so everybody was jump starting into how to do this. And there was a variety of measures taken. Um, 3D printing, obviously, due to speed and accuracy and capacity to uh, make models uh, rapidly and evolve and make lots of prototypes um, was extremely attractive. Um, the other option was uh, injection molding. And while it has certain advantages, it had distinct disadvantages uh, at this phase of the, the crisis. So we began designing uh, with our colleagues at NUS and, and, and design uh, and engineering, uh, began designing and modeling and printing and preclinically testing lots and lots of prototypes, trying to understand what made a swab good, what allowed it to absorb material, release material, and not interfere with material. Uh, so we had to, to uh, to design by scratch the, the preclinical testing. We had to design uh, clinical validation protocols uh, powered to uh, give us useful uh, information. Um, and we had to go through the regulatory steps uh, to be able to uh, perform clinical studies and then uh, collect those specimens, which is uh, challenging because we're dealing in an environment, dealing with an organism uh, that is potentially dangerous to those who are collecting the sample. So we need to know uh, what we're doing. We can't just be casual about this. So uh, there was uh, a clinical team and uh, there was, uh, uh, we worked very closely with our brothers and sisters in the additive manufacturing, mechanical engineering, other colleagues at the School of Medicine for their expertise. Uh, Tomasic was our underwriter uh, and uh, NAMIC uh, and uh, uh, eye to eye as well as Structo were, uh, were key to actually uh, performing this in an expeditious, uh, focused manner. So we met multiple times, uh, uh, I want to say multiple times a day, it seemed like that way, but in some days it was, but we moved this along extremely quickly because of the rapid escalation. You can see the objective was to have 40,000 nasopharyngeal swabs a day, uh, potentially at some point in time up to possibly 200,000 a day, because we knew we could not get uh, swabs from outside the country. We wanted to be uh, self-sufficient. And you can see uh, the swab that uh, we ultimately settled on, uh, and I'll go through why, uh, why it performs so well. It's called the Python or the prototype G. Uh, our nomenclature changed uh, on a regular basis, so it's already, G doesn't necessarily mean the, the, that number of uh, uh, swabs. It just means that's the nomenclature we used at that point in time. So these were the steps, the preclinical steps. We made sure that we were using biocompatible materials. Uh, it had to get past our regulatory agencies, obviously. Uh, it had to be able to mechanically uh, absorb and release uh, material. And you can see the colleagues there who helped us uh, with mechanical testing, to make sure the thing didn't break off in the nose and you'd have to go uh, fish it out and that to make sure the thing wasn't so rigid that it caused bleeding. Um, we did uh, ex vivo, a molecular diagnostic assessment to make sure it didn't interfere with virus and that it, our ability to detect the virus. Uh, and we used initially a coronavirus called mouse hepatitis virus. Uh, and also in the, in the higher level lab, in the BSL-2 plus lab, we used uh, 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 specimens, nasal pharyngeal uh, material that had been spiked with the virus. Um, and then we did clinical value, uh, validation. You can see the National University Hospital and Singapore General Hospital. Uh, we basically replicated the two studies to make sure that our, uh, our data and our statistics were valid. So uh, here's the swab. You can see the G prototype in reality, what it looks like. And you can see that's A and B picture. 
Um, you can see the links and the breakpoints are designed so we can snap off in the tube and we can send it to the laboratory, but it would not snap off in the patient's nose. Um, so it had to have a certain uh, tensile and flexural strength as well as torsional strength because we twist these things. And these performed as good as, if not superior uh, to the commercial swabs. When it came to its ability to absorb fluid from the posterior pharynx and then release it. It didn't absorb as much as the commercial swab, but it released a much higher percentage of that which it absorbed to the point that it was the equivalent amount of fluid released. The specimen, or excuse me, the area noted E uh, shows you that it has, uh, this is actually a swab after it's been removed and then smeared on a slide to see what kind of material we captured. It sounds disgusting, but it allows us to see that we actually have respiratory epithelial cells, um, which are what we're looking for. That's why, where the virus is replicating. So that's, that's where the money is. Uh, so we clearly had sheets and sheets of it, particularly because of the design. If you recall, um, uh, and you can see in, in uh, B, uh, it actually uh, captures uh, nasal pharyngeal material and moves it toward the center where there's a uh, reservoir and then releases it. And it also uh, was able to measure uh, the RNA, uh, excuse me, by PCR, the uh, genetic material present. So uh, I won't go through these results other than to tell you it had a very high correlation uh, with the various uh, genetic targets we were looking for. When you compare the commercial swab to the Python swab, extremely uh, uh, accurate, particularly in the first week of illness uh, when the, um, uh, the patient is most infectious to others. We're interested in detecting people who are at, at risk of transmitting the virus to others. This swab allows us to do that with 100% accuracy, or at least 100% correlation uh, with the uh, commercial swab called a flock swab in this, uh, in this scenario. And as far as pain, we're interested to make sure that its side effects aren't uh, worse or better, excuse me, aren't worse than the commercial swab. And it was not. We, we uh, interviewed each patient uh, and they were somewhat blind as to what swab went in their nose. Uh, this data uh, was compared against another commercial swab in Singapore General Hospital. And again, the correlation was extremely high. In fact, it detected some patients that the commercial swab did not. So what is our current status of this project? Uh, we validated it uh, statistically, clinically, preclinically at National University Hospital and clinically at Singapore General Hospital. Um, the, the equivalent of the Federal uh, Drug and uh, Administration, uh, Food and Drug Administration, excuse me, which is called the Health Science Authority in Singapore, has found it compliant as a, a Class A medical device. Uh, the Ministry of Health in Singapore has endorsed it, and our large, uh, for the public, sec uh, public sector hospitals called ALPS, uh, our agency uh, has purchased uh, it, and there is a, a publication that's been submitted for uh, uh, for consideration uh, in the academic literature. So I want to thank you for your attention and uh, back to you, Mahindran. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was uh, very, very, I think, inspiring for a lot, a lot of us to see this whole project go through in such a short space of time, putting it and even, you know, going through clinical trials. I, I think we've, we've heard um, several renditions of this and today hearing it from you, yourself, I think it's giving us another perspective of how clinicians are also very much clued in into this space. So thank you so much for your efforts and, and you know, best wishes to the team that put this together. Thank you. Um, so we've, we've heard from uh, the, our three organizers and a special one from Prof. Uh, David Allen. Uh, we're now going to be listening to several speakers, um, first from the clinician's point of view, and then we're going to go into the researchers and also the business perspectives. So to kick off, um, the first one of, um, of our first speaker in this segment um, is on personalized sterilizable guides at point of care for maxillofacial and orthopedics. Uh, he's a good uh, friend of ours to NAMIC, to Singapore. Uh, he brings in a lot of insights uh, from across the world uh, and from, from the US. He's a man of many talents. He's an amazing personality and extremely motivated by wanting to give his patients the best possible care and a chance for a new lease of life with 3D printing at its core. And uh, he's an innovator who has adopted 3D printing wholeheartedly and there is more to come from him, I am sure. So live from Minnesota, United States, 
Here is Dr. Jonathan Morris. He's a neuroradiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Jay, all over to you, sir. Thanks so much. So uh, thanks for having me. It's actually Friday where I am and I'm on call. So that's why I'm in scrub. So um, thanks for allowing me to participate. Uh, you can see my screen okay? Yeah, looks good. So while, while we do many things at our manufacturing facility in the hospital, I'm gonna specifically just talk about guides um, given the time constraint here. And well, I'll tell you a little bit about Mayo Clinic, a little bit about our integrated team, and then we'll move on to some clinical uses. So. Um, at Mayo, uh, we're a team of multiple clinicians and sometimes pharmacists, oncologists, are working all together um, to solve problems around patients who come here specifically as a destination medical center. And 3D printing has evolved over the last 15 years at Mayo Clinic, um, just like any other part of healthcare we deliver, that it's become standard of care. One of the things that's unique to Mayo, um, because we are in an isolated area in the United States, that we've always had engineers. So we have about 70 engineers that work for this healthcare institution, not tied to any academic um, university. They just work for a healthcare uh, institution for Mayo Clinic. And what we've done over the last 15 years is incorporated those people inside the clinical um, workflow. So now we have engineers that work in the Department of Radiology, in surgery in and out of the ORs as part of the clinical team, instead of being maybe somebody who works as a consultant or a liaison. And it's really changed a lot of the paradigm where typically those engineers worked in a manufacturing plant, typically we worked here in the hospital, and now we both work in the hospital together by bringing the manufacturing inside the hospital. And the thing that makes it all possible is that we don't have a lot of silos at Mayo. There's no is this just about me? Is this my research, my PAU, my budget, my uh, innovation? That there's just uh, an entire culture of what's best for the patient. And one of the reasons we put it in the hospital is to increase communication. So this was a study that was originally done in the 70s and then redone in 2014 to show the level of communication that happens during physical distance. Now, now we're all physically distanced apart. Um, and there certainly has been a lot of communication, but the organic conversations that happen to improve patient care happen because we are where the doctors work. This is an old picture of what used to be one room that we have. We now have 8,000 square feet of manufacturing with 18 printers and large post-processing rooms in the hospital. So it's not down the street. It's not in a separate building. And the same people are here though. We have a radiologist, we have surgeons, we have engineers, we have healthcare technology management people. Um, all coming together during a normal workday where these people are coming from rounds, this person, Dr. Arce, is coming up from the OR to pick up surgical guides, and it happens all throughout the day organically because we're here. Now, many of you have already talked about um, medical 3D printing, but it's, it's suffice to say it's an umbrella term, and really we use mostly uh, SLA printers and um, SLS printers um, for our guides. We take some imaging, we import it into some software, we use Materialize. Um, it used to be the only one that was FDA approved, but now there's two um, with 3D systems. We bring out the piece of anatomy we want, create meshes, put them on some sort of printer, and then do some sort of post-processing to them. Um, again, most of them are SLA printers and, and uh, nylon printers for the guide. So one of our biggest uses is cranium maxofacial because our face is how we interact with the world. So how the world sees you, it's through your face. You could be missing a finger, you could have a deformed hand, but if you have anything wrong with your face, the world immediately knows because that's the way the world interacts with you, um, is through your face. So it's important that we take patients who show up sometimes with very large tumors and return them to a world where they can go out in public and not be horribly disfigured and still live a normal or somewhat normal life. Um, some things we do are simple, like we need to take a tumor that's in someone's maxilla that's growing up into their skull base, in a, in a young woman in this case, and just simply size a defect. Like this, we're going to take this out. I'm guided by the radiologist. They're going to bend plates on a model, but we need to put her shoulder blade inside of her mouth. So this is a sizing problem of which guides uh, help a lot. We do, uh, we do about 800 guides so far this year, just to give you an example of the numbers that we're doing at this hospital. That's just one site out of a five state enterprise. Um, and this is kind of a workhorse for cranium maxofacial to do free fab 
uh, fibular free flap mandibulectomies. We certainly didn't come up with virtual surgical planning. It was published in 94. But what we did was we brought every step of the process in-house to both do it faster, somewhat we think better, and, and, and be more flexible than, say, maybe a medical device company with engineers that are scattered throughout the world um, and that have different turnaround times. So uh, we'll go through a case. Like this is a young 16-year-old girl with a large mandible tumor. We have to not only um, tell them the borders of the tumor, which means the radiologists are involved because they're the people who know where the actual margin of the tumor is. The surgeon tells us where we need to cut. The dentist and prosthetics people are also involved. So they usually will ask to give or take a tooth depending on where the cuts are made. The cuts are all translated down to the fibula. The fibula is used to construct where the new teeth will be. And then we custom, we either custom make a titanium plate um, or we pre-bend a plate based on this fibula um, plan. And then we make the guide. So this guide only fits this person. It only fits their mandible. The screw holes are where the screw holes for the plate are gonna be. And the same guide and the same cut plates are transitioned down to the fibula in order for us to make the cuts in the fibula necessary um, to bring it up to the face. And you say that it may sound complex, but we've, we've kind of um, IQ'd and have a quality management system enough to do this with our form lab printers, which we've independently validated at about $15,000 of geometry, um, that these guides are biocompatible, sterilizable in an autoclave machine, um, and done all the work some of the previous speakers have done to actually do this and be safe. We make things on the fly, like these fixation trays. So one of the things our surgeons asked us is said, hey, even though I make these cuts that are beautiful, I still have to put them together and I don't really have a great way to do that. And that's like just small pieces of innovation that happen on the fly here um, when we're making these cases. So that fixation tray came up like within a week and we had something for them. Again, the dentists are involved, particularly if it's benign disease, because they can wake up with teeth um, if it's benign. When we take the tumors out, we do things like surface scanning in order to print pathologic specimens that we then go on to teach rad path courses with um, to have more realistic models in the future. But it really what we've been focused on is how do we do class two sterilizable devices at the point of care, which in the US at least is still under the practice of medicine given the um, regulatory infrastructure that we've been helping build with the FDA over the last five years. Um, and again, we, val we independently validate our entire system as well as our materials. So I don't think anybody should go out and buy a printer and start printing things to screw on to things that prolong blood and mucus exposure um, without independently validating their entire system and then having ways to verify it. Because when you open someone's face and you're going to screw on a piece of plastic and then stick an oscillating saw in it, um, you better make sure that they're not going to have a foreign body reaction, that they're not going to have any reaction if you leave some shavings in there, and anything else that can happen with a foreign body, because these are how they're actually used every day um, here. And then this is a fixation tray. So you can imagine trying to bend a plate, screw a fibula together, and then stick it in someone's open face and do all this work in an open cavity. It's incredibly complex, whereas they can do it all on the model, which improves bony union, reduces free flap time exposure without having a vascular hookup. And we've proven this time and time again. It saves about two hours in the OR. So we have better outcomes, less time in the OR at about $80 a minute, uh, easy in our ORs. Um, and we have a better outcome using about, you know, what comes out to be a couple hundred dollars worth of plastic. Uh, if we go into the maxilla, which taking the mandible out is fairly straightforward for these people, but when we go into taking tumors out of the upper jaw, where we may or may not have to take the eye with it, um, the cuts are more complex, the exposure is more complex, but it's the same idea that we're taking a bone from somewhere, mirror imaging the normal to the abnormal side, and then building a plate system um, that fits only this person to make them look not only uh, phenotypically normal, but also cancer-free, so that when we put this guide on this patient, that this happens with absolute precision, which again, not only makes the surgeon more confident, but saves time in the operative room, less time to sleep, less time under anesthesia, with an increased rate of bony union. Um, and you can see how precise these cuts are and how precise this fits in every single time, which is really why we grew so fast. So this is just a quote from one of our surgeons. You know, he's been taking a pop to maxilla for 
half a career, uh, 15 years at least, and, and they constantly come back and say, this just wasn't possible before we had you in the hospital. Because uh, the goal is to take someone like this, remove half of their mandible and return them to the world looking very similar than they used to. We do quite a bit of mirror imaging as guidance when we have patients like this that have large tumors or abundant fibrous dysplasia that we can produce a, a normalized skull and use it as a guide to say how much tissue do we want to resect if it's benign or how are we going to create a prosthesis um, if it is malignant that will withstand 70 gray of radiation. So mirror imaging comes to play in guides. In orthopedic oncology, uh, we do a lot of guided surgeries. So this is a patient that's 15 years old, has a large tumor in his leg bone. In order for him to have any chance of meaningful long-term survival, he has to have a two centimeter margin on each side. And then we have to put something in there if we're not going to do a limb amputation. So um, probably two decades ago, he would have got a limb amputation. And now they do fibular resections and there's different ways to do it, but I'll just show you one. So it takes a radiologist to say where the extent of the tumor is. So we can say, when we say well, there's two centimeters, the surgeon can trust us. And this is why we just can't have a technician or an engineer doing this because they'll have no idea where the margin of a intraosseous um, tumor is. We build a guide using very similar techniques as we did before, and then we print it. And then this guide um, is used to go on the femur it's precisely uh, placed, so we have two centimeter margin without any risk of perforating the tumor. And then the surgeon's gonna have to take the fibula again and a cadaver bone. When we get cadaver bones, we have one day to work with them in order to create guides for the cadaver bone when they were received from the bone bank. So it's an incredible crunch time that you can't do using a medical device company um, to take that piece of bone, put it inside a cadaver bone, and then cut this cadaver bone so that it fits perfectly in the guided area that you just took out. And this patient was able to A, save his limb, and B, be out of the hospital in four days and walking around in under 10 days uh, with limited independence. And guides are what help that. Um, because uh, once we take a large part of you off, there's only so much more of you we can take. So when we have to go back after we've done something, we also use guides to keep you active in your life. In general orthopedics, um, in patients who are young that need cartilage transfer, so this is an elbow, this is a 3D printed guide that we're doing a trajectory planning on and we're building a system to be able to take a piece of cadaver bone, a cadaver cartilage rather, and put another person's cartilage inside of your elbow. So now when we get the biobank specimen, we have one day to work on it. And when this has to be precise, so that when we make this defect, that this fits perfectly, because if it doesn't, you have a high chance of loosening and non-union and that piece of cartilage not taken. Um, when we started doing scaphoid fractures, this is a part of your wrist that has a bad blood supply to it. It has a high rate of non-union. And when we came up with, a, one of the surgeons here came up with the surgery, he said, well, I want to take a piece from your knee that's a non-weight-bearing part of cartilage, and then flip it up into your wrist so we can build this bone back. So we mirror image the normal to the abnormal side, and then we get a precision cut every time with a vascular pedicle that fits exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, we do a lot of central pin guidance in the shoulder, so this is just a simple guide that fits on the glenoid aspect of the shoulder to guide the central pin um, so that when we're putting uh, the central pin down, which needs the greatest amount of screw contact so the implant doesn't loosen. It ends up in the exact right place. And this is a case we did uh, last week, so I added it. This woman had an implant in 2017, um, and I think this case really shows the benefit of what we're doing. So this patient had an implant in 2017 has developed severe pain and extreme bone loss in the glenoid, um, and you can see how much wear in this shoulder has been. And she has so much pain that her arm's in a sling and she doesn't move it um, uh, because it hurts that bad. So they asked us to model it and come up with a way that we could actually build up that glenoid in order to put a humeral component on it, which meant we had to take the data we had. We, had a, we have imaging protocols with metal artifact reduction that we've built using multi-energy CT scanners. Um, and then, we built a four-part guide to not only put the pins in in the right place, but also put the 
uh, humeral head in the right place. So we needed a guide to put the tracks where the screws were gonna go into the thickest part. So we did FEA mapping of the bone. We needed a guide to take another piece of bone and shape it. And then we needed a guide to put the humeral head pins in. So this is, has to be removed uh, from our arm. The surgeon is looking down at uh, just this part. So you can't see the forest uh, through the trees here. And you have to say, I have a very narrow window to get a screw in a place of a bone that's largely destroyed. So here you can see a 3D printed guide. Here we're taking a piece of the iliac. So we're taking a piece of bone from their pelvic brim. We're shaping it to the size of the glenoid that we just made. So this guide is just meant to shape this bone perfectly for where we're gonna put it. They can only have a couple screw tracks because this can fracture. And then this is what it's gonna look like. So there's no way to do this without doing guided surgery um, in order to put all the screws in the right place, get the bone in the right place, contour it to the glenoid, put the humeral base plate down on there with all these screws going in the right place, put the humeral head, the implant, and this guide, this four guide system, allowed this woman to have a new lease on life with her arm. And you'd say, well, that must have taken a long time. And we have the infrastructure now that that took two days. So from the time the surgeon walked up here to the time our engineers were here, because of the ecosystem we've built, that took two days and she was moving her arm without pain on day one. So we've built a, a custom workflow that goes from an EPIC order, an electronic medical system order, that triggers the correct protocol, which is sometimes dual energy metal subtraction, that then goes to an ecosystem of, we have a 16 printers, 18 printers in the hospital on that range from form labs all the way up to, you know, 500,000 industrial, uh, $500,000 industrial printers. And we have titanium printers downtown um, with the goal of making custom implants at the point of care. And that gets dictated, billed, and then delivered to the OR all in-house in real time. And, you know, so we've had to build this entire ecosystem of how this happens to get to a CAD file, to get to print and post-processing. And I could give an entire lecture just on the QMS system that we've had to build for caliper measurement, metrology, packaging, delivering. And I think it shows like, if you could incorporate 3D printing across your enterprise, this is one small um, lecture about one small thing we do, but we touch about 2,000 patients alive, uh, lives with 3D printing every year. With guides, we made about 800 guides just this year alone, and the growth curve continues to increase. And now we're doing it across state lines, across uh, the country where we might scan a patient one place, design a guide another place, um, print in yet a third place. Um, and it's really allowed us uh, to advance the care that we deliver to patients, which is the only goal we really have. So with that, I'll stop. Um, and if I see some questions in the q and I'll try and answer them as, as we go. Dr. Morris, thank you so much. I think it's indeed, I mean, you setting the, the standards here in terms of point of care and really bringing all the various players right into the hospital to, to find solutions uh, for your patients. I think that's amazing. And definitely, I think our audience have lots of questions. Uh, we will take all the questions right at the end. So kindly type in your questions on the Q&A chat box, uh, keep, it, keep them flowing. Uh, or if you wanna save them to the end, we're also okay. So just keep engaging with uh, all our speakers and understand what they are talking about. And we will definitely like to hear from you. So Jay, thanks so much for that. Um, now moving on to new development in pediatric care, leveraging on potential 3D printing. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Chen Cheng. He has been a regular speaker at our key summits, and always he comes with new insights for us to learn from him and understand. So that's always a, a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Chen uh, on our events. And he's a senior consultant at the Division of Pediatric Cardiology, Depa Department of Pediatrics, Kutek Quad National University Children's Medical Institute, National University Hospital. He's also a co-trust lead at the NUS Center for Additive Manufacturing, AM.NUS. His clinical expertise covers congenital heart disease, fetal cardiology, cardiomyopathy, and heart failure. And the use of 3D printing of heart models for surgical planning is pretty much in the core of how he's approaching this. So let's hear it from Dr. Chen himself. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you once again. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
thanks Jenny and thanks uh, Namik for the invitation. Now I'll be talking about um, some of the development uh, in 3D printing in our uh, my actual practice in pediatric cardiology. But um, as this talk is catered towards the new development in pediatrics, I'd just like to give a broader overview in what we can do uh, from the perspective of 3D printing uh, in medicine. So I can broadly divide uh, the application of 3D printing in medicine into two big groups. One, uh, the modeling, and of course the second group, the therapeutics. From the surgical, uh, from the modeling perspective, we could use the surgical, uh, the 3D printed models as surgical uh, guides, or even to use this for preoperative planning. We could use these hard models for education, be it educating the trainees or educating uh, the patients, or even educating uh, very high level uh, surgeons themselves uh, by means of surgical sim simulation. From the perspective of uh, therapeutics, these 3D printed devices can be used as prosthesis or even as uh, bioresorbable implants, which I can show you in, in a bit. Last but not least, of course, in the paradigm of uh, tissue engineering, we can use uh, the application of bioprinting in advancing the medicine of tissue, uh, uh, regenerative medicine. Of course, um, it all starts with imaging. And the imaging in itself is fairly routine, be it a CT scan or an MRI scan. But the most time-consuming aspect is basically, uh, actually the segmentation in converting the DICOM data into the STL format. And we will subject this STL format into the 3D printer and the model can be printed. And the printing time is basically linear to the amount of material needed based on the size of the model. And voila, this is what we get uh, from a hard model in itself. Now, the most important thing about the hard modeling uh, is that it really changes our perception of what imaging is. So we are in a new step of the evolution of human mankind uh, with the knowledge that's brought into surgery. It all started with the understanding of anatomy from animal dissection and then human dissection subsequently. However, with the advent of X-ray and CT and MRI imaging, this has then shifted our understanding from the very generic anatomy to one that is patient specific. So our goal here is to enable the next step, the next step in the evolution of cardiovascular imaging, not just to diagnose the, uh, the disease or the condition, but to be able to bring the conclusion in the head and how we imagine it in the surgeon's brain to the operating theater, but to also use engineering on the images and to bring patient specific guides or custom implants to predict or to plan Surgery. So this is where we are today, where we use uh, the 3D printed heart models uh, as a way to plan the surgery. We all know that congenital heart disease is a heterogeneous condition. It comes in all shapes and forms. Uh, in the most complex of situations, because the heart is three-dimensional, to be viewing the heart in two dimension on a, thing, on a plain screen, it's doing the patient some form of injustice. However, if we could print out the 3D model, which we have done, and I've been using 3D printed heart models for surgical planning for the past six years, uh, mainly in, the, in patients with complex anatomy. Not just to be able to communicate with the surgeon, but to be able to diagnose accurately the complex anatomy within the heart. So no matter how good our 3D graphics are on a flat screen, there is nothing, nothing like a model in our hands. Uh, to be able to view the patient's exact anatomy. Now, does this then translate to better patient outcome? And indeed, it does. Um, reports after reports in the literature uh, has demonstrated that in more than half the cases, a 3D printed model helps redefine the surgical approach. Now, by redefining, we, it, it means that based on the conventional imaging of uh, echocardiography or ultrasound, uh, CT or MRI, we may have gotten the anatomy wrong and therefore communicated it erroneously with the surgeon. But with the 3D printed model, we can redefine this surgical approach. Bearing in mind that there is currently a lack of a strong evidence that 3D printed models change surgical outcome. But intuitively, anecdotally, based on our own experience, we know that the 3D printed heart model limits the time that a surgeon needs to spend exploring the patient's anatomy intraoperatively. And therefore, this cuts down on cardiopulmonary bypass time, this cuts down on anesthetic time, and overall improves 
the surgical outcome for these patients. Of course, in order to uh, be able to advocate further and be able to put forth stronger evidence for this, we definitely need a randomized trial comparing patients with 3D printed heart models and without 3D printed heart models. But this is, I would expect this to be a Herculean task, um, even with a multi-institutional collaboration. But suffice to say that based on anecdotal experience and our own practical experience locally, we know that this has changed the face of how we approach patient surgical decision making and surgical approach tremendously and are therefore a, a, a truly a game changer in my daily practice in the medicine of congenital heart disease. But beyond patient care, what we can also do is to use these 3D printed heart models for trainee education, be it our local trainee or be it in an international platform where we have conducted a hands-on workshop for regional participants to go through the cardiac uh, pathologies uh, based on ultrasound imaging, uh, as well as translating it into real heart models. Now, historically, we have always been able to do this only using pathologic uh, specimens where patients have died, uh, relatives would have donated the heart in order for us to be able to appreciate the intracardiac anatomy better. But with the shortage of such uh, pathologic specimens and the increasing survival of our patients, we no longer need for these pathologic specimens, we can 3D print these hearts into models and we can make multiple copies of them for as many people to be able to appreciate this intricate anatomy in as much as possible. But beyond just training the trainees, it also, in my own experience, improves the communication amongst the medical team and with the patients and families. Now, in this day and age, in the 21st century of medical practice, we know that communication uh, forms a centerpiece of our practice. We may be good in what we uh, in diagnostic process, we may be good in our treatment uh, regimen, but communication forms the tenet of our practice. And the increased ability to communicate accurately amongst the medical team and to be able to communicate accurately with the patient and the family is invaluable. Next, in terms of using the model for education, it can be used for hands-on surgical training. And this is um, what we have done uh, to be able to use this model. We use a hollow model rather than a blood volume model uh, in order for us to be able to practice on these models on uh, surgical repair. Now, it is not only just for the trainees. Some of this complex anatomy where uh, they are rarely encountered, the surgeons would also find it beneficial to be able to practice on these hearts prior to the surgery itself. Now this is uh, more so in the setting of Singapore where we are small, volume can be small, and therefore uh, the ability to be able to practice on these models enhances the surgical skills, be it for the trainees or the surgeons themselves. In the recent times, going beyond cardiology, but something that we commonly see associated with our patients with uh, congenital heart disease are the airway malformations, or in certain situations where these patients can have associated uh, tracheal or, laryn uh, or bronchomalacia where the airways are soft and collapsible. Now these patients come in all sizes and the airways can be in different shapes and therefore the one size fit all approach is, is completely obsolete in our practice. However, with the advent of 3D printing, we are able to 3D print the airway anatomy and to customize uh, the external uh, stent or splint that we could apply on this collapsible airway in order to strengthen them while waiting for the patients to grow in size and the airway to grow. And therefore improving this uh, uh, children's outcome significantly, not just by means of improving survivability, but in also improving their quality of life. And instead of having to be uh, ventilator dependent, they can now be tracheostomized and not be hooked up to the ventilator and therefore would be able to interact with their families and develop in a more optimal manner. Mo moving on to an area that is closer to my heart, heart failure and the application of uh, 3D printing. Now, we can use 3D printing and 3D modeling in order to be able to uh, plan uh, the uh, implant of a ventricular assist device. Now in adults, this, uh, this is fairly straightforward where the devices were designed for adult size patients to begin with. However, in children with different sizes, with different weight, it is difficult for us to anticipate or even predict 
whether or not these devices that were made for adults would be able to fit into the thoracic cavity of these patients for us to be able to safely implant the ventricular assist device to support the failing heart. Now, this is a patient in whom uh, the complex anatomy had then culminated to heart failure, and we needed to decide whether or not a uh, device uh, such as this would be appropriately implanted into the patient's chest cavity. The heart was printed out, but the rest of it was done by using surgical modeling to be able to fit this device that was uh, virtually implanted into the thoracic cavity. So this is a, a next advent uh, in the recent times for heart failure management in children. However, to push the boundary further, it is the 3D printing technology that has found applicability in the fields of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine in the form of bioprinting. Now, specifically within cardiology, so within the medicine of heart failure, um, we, there has been a, a reported technique to print vasculature, myocardium, and the valves. And this is what we have done uh, that we use um, as a proof of concept, we use red. Uh, neonatal cardiomyocytes to print out pieces of myocardium. Now, the greatest challenge in printing myocardial patches are that we are not able to print thick myocardial layers because they are just too thick without sufficient blood supply. Now, the next step in what we need to do, having been able to print um, uh, cardiomyocytes in myocardial patch forms is to be able to print up microvasculature in order for us to be able to perfuse these myocardial patches and increase the survival of these myocardial patches before we could implant them onto patients um, and therefore minimizing the need for uh, scarce resources such as donor organs. Now with this, I'd like to just summarize again the application of uh, 3D printing in our current practice. Now, beyond just uh, pediatrics, but I'm sure this applies to any other field out there, that um, beyond just modeling, the next uh, advent of that 3D printing would be in the area of bioprinting and in tissue engineering. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chen. I think you really have a heart for all your patients, especially children. And uh, thank you, and we wish you all the best in, in your endeavor. And using 3D printing to bring uh, happiness uh, to your patients. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Tu Chawe. He's a National University of Singapore medical graduate, had his training in various hospitals in Singapore in the Diagnostic Radiology Training Program, obtaining specialization and accreditation in 2012. He's currently a senior consultant at the Department of Vascular and Interventional Radiology and Director of Interventional Services. He has very keen interest in the realm of interventional oncology and palliation experience in ablation of liver, lung, kidney, and bone tumors. Here to talk to us about 3D printing at the radiology unit is Dr. Tu. All right, um, I hope everybody can see. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So we're going to talk a little bit about 3D printing and the radiology uh, department. I have no relevant disclosures and like to acknowledge uh, some of my clinical collaborators as well as my engineers, as well as um, other 3D work collaborators. Um, now, 3D printing is really an extension of what we do, as previously dis, um, discussed by Dr. Morris. Anatomical accuracy and clinical relevant reports and opinions. We help to plan complex uh, operations to ensure accuracy, data privacy, and accurate billing, which is very important, the back-end process. And we want to engage clinicians as well as to share our knowledge. Um, just um, a brief introduction as SGH here. I don't think our work processes or our internal capabilities match that of Mayo Clinic. So the 3D printing services is really, uh, we have to send out data, we have to collaborate with multiple vendors and multiple other parties at the moment. But really when the workflow or requests of 3D printing come, it is quite similar to that of what we do uh, in radiology. You know, first someone wants a, a, re a request for an imaging, we need to check for the appropriateness of the request. Sometimes the tests are wrong, sometimes the sequences they ask is wrong. We give a scan opinion, depending on where you are and how the billing works, you may bill the patient at this time. You acquire the scan, you do the data processing, you uh, do the reporting, and then you review the clinicians. The workflow for training process, uh, 3D printing, you know, the order may be a little bit jumbled up, but it's kind of the same. We have requests for 3D printing. We have to select the appropriate data. You know, there are CT scans, there are very phases of CT scans. And for those of you who handle MR data, you do know that even within MRI, you're going to have 20 over sequences for some studies. 
very importantly, if we are going to send out data, data anonymization and tagging is very, very crucial, especially in this day and age of uh, uh, data privacy. We have to process the data, as Chinkit has uh, said. We need to do segmentation, make sure things are right. We need to discuss and review and change things and then deliver and then build the patient. Now, um, we wish everything is this easy, you know, easy segmentation, a right click conversion to SDL. Um, but most of the times in what we do is doesn't happen. So for the purposes of 3D printing for donor livers, this is mainly for surgical education. So we want to help our surgeons uh, um, to uh, understand the 3D anatomy of donor livers. Now um, for uh, liver transplant, other than just transplant the liver itself, we have to take care in um, connecting the various plumbing, the bowel ducts, the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the hepatic vein. So a good grass anatomy is crucial here. And this is uh, work that we done with Prema. So, you know, when something is segmented, you know, sometimes the engineers do this, sometimes we help them. We have to go back and really look at what's missing. For example, a segment 4A portal vein here is missing. It can be very time consuming. Um, there's really nothing very much automated at the moment. And for those of you who, who understand this, well, we can get the liver, hepatic artery, portal vein, hepatic vein data from CT scans. The bowel ducts are best seen on MRI and we have to fuse them together. And uh, we have to then ensure fidelity across all these modalities. Um, so initially when we print, you know, this is quite ugly, um, aesthetically, I hate it. Then we thought, fine, we get it a bit transparent, but then this looks and weighs like a bowling ball after that. And then we go back to the room and we thought, hey, why don't we skeletonize everything? The surgeon don't really need to look at the back of the liver. They seldom look at it anyway, even while operating. And what they really want to see is the underlying structures. So we did this for them. And then we get this delivered. Can be quite brittle though, so some parts do fall off. And then finally, we get it to a point whereby it almost looked like a trophy um, in the, the, the doctor's uh, room. That it again uh, go for patient education as well as education for their own surgical staff. One thing we really want to take care of is health data privacy here in SGH. And the question for those of you who transfer a lot of images in and out is, how is data getting from radiology to the vendor? Um, I chose this slide because there's still the patient's name here on the Microsoft PowerPoint's uh, default setting here. Um, are you getting a junior doctor to burn the CD at radiology, put it in a sleeve and send it out? Um, do the junior doctors know which images to get? Is it anonymized? Who pays for this CD and who holds on to the CD eventually? And, and the answer is, are you protecting yourself from data leaks? Um, this is just a sample of the information available on DICOM tags that is still there if you don't anonymize the data carefully. We do know that in recent years in Singapore and around the world, we're starting to see a lot of in, uh, a focus on uh, privacy data and certainly, you know, we, we have been hacked before a couple of years ago. And so we are really kind of stringent when it comes to this. And it's not just the DICOM tags. When we comes to facial data, um, the face can be recognized as well. So we do have, if we are sending facial data out, um, where possible, we have to then take out parts of the face so that when someone reconstruct this, there's really no good way to trace it back to the patient. Um, billing is quite important as well. Um, so for currently for uh, um, places that send the bill out to certain vendors, if the vendor don't give you an implant at the end of the day, sometimes you have to uh, get the vendor to bill the patient separately, which may have a problem with reimbursement. So what we've done in SGH is that we've created a service code within radiology to include 3D printing into the patient's bill for easier reimbursement. And however, depending on where you work, the hospitals usually charge a surcharge uh, on top of this. Um, so this is uh, something that we do um, uh, fairly routinely now. Uh, we uh, 3D printing for complex uh, facial fractures. This is one of the easiest ones that we do, as you can see the facial fractures here. Uh, we saw this is to allow surgeons to save time before surgery. Um, so uh, we do this uh, in-house and what I normally do for the surgeons is I label these for them so that when the, uh, and then we try and construct this like little Legos that they can bend off later. See, they can bend all these little uh, pieces off and then reconstruct them and then pre-bend the plates. I find that you know, we, when we mark and label the individual fragments, uh, this makes it a little bit easier for them. This is a slightly more complex example here. And of course, um, as previously stated, Dr. Morris, there is always the fibula flaps um, with the surgical guys that we can do later. 
um, something that we think that we need. So in, in this collab collaborative environment, um, what we do need is better platforms. Um, often I struggle to compare the DICOM images and SDL side by side, especially for the complex liver stuff. When you are really looking at a tiny one mm bound up on one data set, another data set, sometimes I'm doing it on my phone. Um, we think that going forward, if we do think that 3D printing is going to be you know, a part of radiology, um, our PAC systems really need to then take the SDL file. Um, maybe we want to move more planning to virtual. Um, as we said before, we want a more secure uh, remote working, especially in times of COVID-19. Um, so this one, um, we uh, collaborated with one of our surgeons, Nick. So this is a chronic calcaneum fracture. Uh, this is the part of your heel um, that you walk around with. As you can see, this is normal. When you want to, um, a normal heel really should, you know, not lie flat on the floor. It, it, it goes, uh, that's a lot of crazy thing in biomechanics. So for this one, we 3D printed. Um, so this one is a bit hard to plan virtually, unlike the other uh, places of the face. And then um, Nick went ahead and then you know, chopped up the pieces to how he wants to reconstruct uh, the calcanium after that. And so this is something that he says, ah, you know, we will chop this part up. We will then put the, uh, uh, the tip of the heel in a different place. And then we will use some bone fragments to lift up the talus uh, from the calcanium. So after that, we have to then put the pieces back together and find out what's missing and then uh, print surgical guides for him. And hopefully uh, they just arrived. And I think he uh, wants to go back to put on the model to prepare for a while. So if you invite me back next year, I'll tell you how well this case goes. Um, but really in conclusion, while it is personalized medicine, I think in radiology, uh, what we do want to stress is the institutional workflow that is key, right? Um, the field should accommodate uh, all interested parties as all our speakers um, have alluded to. Um, we want better platform to transfer and visualize the data. And we hope that there is an interested radiologist near the center and certainly here in SGH. Um, one of our young associate consultants, Dr. Mark Tan, has formed an interest group that hopefully we can talk about it a little bit more. And for those of you who want to contact me, this is my email and uh, I'm available. So thank you very much for the invitation and I hope to take some questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tu, uh, telling us about what's happening at the radiology department uh, at SGH. So uh, now we would like to hear from uh, Dr. Lim Yakun. She's from the radiology, uh, you know, uh, she, yeah. So she's going to be talking about the development of marking breast oncoplastic surgery simulator using 3D printing technology for surgical education. Uh, from radiology to surgical model and simulator, extensive research has been done uh, by Dr. Lim. She's a senior consultant at uh, Breast Department KK Women's and Children's Hospital and clinical associate professor with the Duke NUS Medical School. She is an oncoplastic uh, breast surgeon and believes that a good cosmetic breast result is as paramount to uh, as a safe oncological for a safe oncological outcome. Uh, she has several publications with most of her works focusing specifically on the surgical oncoplastic techniques most applicable to Asian women. She has also founded the Singapore Breast Oncoplastic Surgery Symposium in 2015, and this was to really to increase the uh, regional awareness of oncoplastic. Uh, breast surgery. She has pioneered the minimal scar mastectomy technique and is also the inventor of the world's first virtual breast oncoplastic surgery simulator, VBOSS, used for the training. And to tell us more about this, uh, here's Dr. Lim. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lim Gyok Hun, a breast surgeon from KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. Today, I'm very honoured to be able to speak on the development of Marking Breast Oncoplastic Surgery Simulator, MBOSS, using 3D printing technology for surgical education. For those who may not know, breast cancer is the most common cancer among women worldwide. In Singapore, about 1 in 13 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime and surgery remains the mainstay of treatment for breast cancer. Oncoplastic surgery, which is a form of breast surgery, can allow larger volume of breast cancer to be removed while still conserving the breast and achieving a good cosmetic outcome. However, the training of oncoplastic breast surgery is not easy. 
It requires the practice of marking on the breast. These markings are essential to guide the surgeons on where to make the incision on the breast. Traditionally, these breast marking practice were done with human volunteers, but there are logistic difficulties in recruiting volunteers for such training. As a result, simulators has been developed to replace human volunteers for the training of oncoplastic surgery marking. One such example is the master trainer as shown here. The master trainer could allow the practice of marking and also the surgical steps of oncoplastic surgery to be performed. Even so, we have currently very limited droppy breast simulators available for the teaching of oncoplastic surgery and the existing simulators can be costly. As a result, a novel teaching model named Marking Breast Oncoplastic Surgery Simulator MBOSS has been developed recently. This model was developed jointly with Wang Xue and Prof. H.P. Li from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the National University of Singapore. This model was developed as a byproduct from a NAMIC grant. MBOSS was fabricated with silicon using a mold produced by sterolithography, a 3D printing technique. Emboss was designed as a vest and then fitted onto a torso. The 3D printing technology was valuable because it allows the emboss to simulate the human droppy breast very much in appearance. Trying to simulate the texture of the human breast was a little bit tougher, but we managed to succeed and emboss could be maneuvered in a similar way as the female breast during the marking practice. In addition, MBOSS has got a smooth surface profile which allows repeated marking to be performed. This is a video demonstrating how the marking was done for just one of the many types of oncoplastic surgery. As you can see, the breast model needs to be moved from side to side for the marking to be done. This marking is unique to every individual and needs to be very precisely placed. For example, the angle between the two lines which I've drawn previously matters. The length of the marking matters as well. This marking is important because this is where the incision on the breast is going to be placed by the surgeon during the operation. If the marking is not properly done, the wrong incision may be made and the subsequent operation may be a disaster. As a result, proper training of this marking is needed to avoid subsequent complications. However, as the breast is an intimate organ, we often have difficulty trying to recruit patients for such training purposes. So how do we know if MBOSS is a good teaching tool for oncoplastic surgery? Well, to evaluate that, we conducted a randomized control trial with the volunteers in the control arm. This evaluation study was funded by the Academic Medicine Education Institute Education Grant. To evaluate the educational value of MBOSS, we use the Kaipatrick model as shown here for evaluation. The Kaipatrick model is divided into four different levels of assessment. For level one, the participants were assessed via a survey on their satisfaction level with the training. This is the most common type of feedback we often conduct for most causes. However, we did not just stop there. We also did a level two assessment to determine if there was a knowledge gain among the participants. This was assessed via a written test before and after the training. To bring it further, we also conducted a level three assessment to determine if they could apply their newly learned skill by assessing their marking skills on a volunteer. Finally, the outcome which we are most interested in, a level four assessment. We wanted to see if the participants could incorporate their newly learned marking skills into their daily work and whether this translated to any positive outcomes for the patients that they were treating. This was done via a survey conducted six months after the completion of their training. This was the study design. 40 doctors were grouped according to their level of training for oncoplastic surgery. And then within each level of training, they were then randomized into two groups to either receive hands-on practice and training using the MBOSS or to the group that will receive hands-on practice and training using a human volunteer. Then both groups were assessed via the Kaipatrick model for these four levels of outcomes. Results of this study showed that MBOSS 
had comparable learning outcome in level 1, 3 and 4 compared to using the volunteer for training. The group using the MBOS fared better in level 2, which is, level, which is knowledge gained, compared to the group using volunteers for training. The results of this study have been written up and was accepted for publication. The implication of the study result is that MBOS is a comparable training tool as the volunteer, but could overcome the limitations associated with volunteer, such that MBOS could allow effective training of larger groups of surgeons at own time and pace. Training is no longer restricted by the logistic issues of looking for a volunteer, the issue of volunteer fatigue, and the need to keep the class small due to privacy reasons. MBOS, in comparison to other simulators, is another option to choose from. MBOS is also less costly compared to other models, and it could also be used repeatedly. In conclusion, 3D printing technology through the making of MBOS has made breast surgery training more accessible. This has in turn allowed the surgical skills acquired to be translated into beneficial clinical outcomes for our patients. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Gapun. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we've heard in the first half uh, from all the clinicians about what's going on and all the work that they're doing. I think it's now to listen to some of our researchers as well as our industry professionals who are really looking at applications and pushing the boundaries of uh, 3D printing. Um, and uh, so in this section, we're going to listen to Dr. Lin Jing, Ellen Deng from Printer Press, Dr. Uh, Tan Ming Jie from De Novo Sciences, and Prof. Paul Ho. So to kick off this segment, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Lin Jing to talk about regulatory challenges on disruptive innovation devices. He holds a PhD from NTU uh, in Singapore, and prior to joining Osteopor, he had conducted research on biomaterials for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, and developed material fabrication platforms. Uh, he has been very much involved in Osteopor to bring it uh, to bring new regulatory and quality milestones to the company. Uh, in addition, he's also led the expansion of product and therapy portfolio and contributed to the improvement in manufacturing okay. efficiency. Here is Dr. Lin Jing on regulatory challenges on disruptive innovative devices. So uh, thanks everyone for listening in to uh, what I intend to share today about regulatory challenges on disruptive innovation. So my name is Lim Jing. So I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Osteopor International. Um, the outline of my presentation today would uh, focus on the following few topics, um, disruptive innovation, regulation versus innovation, uh, making a case for 3D printing in the clinical community, and followed by some uh, closing remarks. So um, Clayton Christensen is very well known in this area uh, for being a thought leader in defining disruption or disruptive innovation. So disruption basically descri describes a process where a smaller company with uh, fewer resources is able to successfully challenge established incumbent businesses. And uh, this is where mainstream customers start to adopt. Then we have effectively, uh, we have effectively led to disruption. So according to uh, Clayton Christensen's theory, this typically gets started in so-called low-end footholds or new market footholds. So before I go into explaining this chart, let me orientate you to this. Uh, on the left axis, vertical axis, you see product performance. Uh, on the right axis, you see profitability that's obviously related to the company. And on the horizontal axis, you have the time factor. So the blue lines represent the customer's willingness to pay for performance. In general, as product performance improves, customer's willingness grows. At the same time, profitability for the company grows as they hit for the high end of the market. The red solid line indicates an incumbent company that is growing towards providing for the high end of the market. You will notice that as they move across the various market segments, the low end of the market or the new market is the first to be neglected. So this is where a company like Osteopor can focus on disruptive innovation to target market segments that are deemed uh, low end or new for the incumbent. Does this mean that low end of the market is where cheap products can be sold readily? Uh, I do not think so because the adoption of medical technology is entirely dependent on quality and the outcomes of the product. So the company is required to demonstrate quality 
And as a matter of fact, time is also a factor in quality. So regardless of which market segment the a medical technology is targeting, quality requirements is a must. So having a brief understanding of what disruptive innovation is, um, we then go into some of the push and pull factors between uh, regulations and innovation. So somewhere in the 2015, University College London actually looked into whether standards and regulations can keep up with technology. So based on their research, they find that the current approach to regulations is sometimes infeasible and difficult to enforce. Uh, sometimes it works against healthcare innovation, um, particularly in making bespoke components uh, where 3D printing raises concerns on quality control. Uh, last but not least, I think it's the main thing about whether the design meets the user's needs. Uh, somewhere in 2017, the Austrian medical device sector also looked into um, research and innovation, uh, looking at the barriers and drivers that drive research and innovation. So based on their survey of eight SME owners and founders, uh, they discovered that uh, there may be a slightly more barriers to obstruct innovation than there are drivers to support innovation. Uh, and one of the pain points that you see that is an occurring theme is that regulatory and certification processes require resource, whether it's finance or human. On the other hand, at times, because of the development of health technology, it is difficult to have sufficient information at a point in time about regulations and process. Uh, and that leads to unclear regulatory focus, changing regulatory frameworks, especially at different geographical scales. So for example, what is being practiced in the US may be different from what's in the EU as well as the rest of the world. And last but not least, um, there are, I think always at the beginning, a lot of theory-driven regulations that are divorced from reality. So it becomes difficult to implement or it becomes difficult to commercialize. Now the FDA being, uh, well, the, the leader in regulations, particularly on the medical device um, sector, they have also put out their thought process uh, in the form of a review, uh, which they published somewhere in 2016. So this is on additive manufactured medical products and what they think about this. So their basic comment is that um, while using additive manufacturing may present additional technical challenges in terms of manufacturing controls, uh, device performance, biocompatibility, biocompatibility and sterilization, it does not in general raise new questions of safety or effectiveness. So somewhere in 2016 and 17, I've also been um, speaking about this at ASTM forums, whereby 3D printing is largely regarded as a manufacturing technology and the design controls or the product and process controls that we put in place do not largely depart from what is being taught at the point in time. In terms of the regulatory pathway, um, the FDA also thinks that despite the technological advancements or characteristics of additive manufacturing, this has not changed the pathway for medical products that are reviewed by the FDA. Uh, you still have your traditional 510k routes, you have your abbreviated routes, you have safety and performance evaluation pathways. Um, if your device is of a very high risk and uh, is life sustaining, then you go into a pre-market uh, approval process. So I think the, the pathways still apply, uh, not only in the pre-market sense, but also during manufacturing quality, during production. So now that we uh, have a we, we should probably go closer to, to what Osteopor does. So we are in the business of uh, 3D printing bone scaffolds that are made entirely out of synthetic polymers or polymer composites. And uh, I think a lot of us have always been under the impression that autologous bone grafting is free. Um, so these group of authors wanted to investigate how free this process is actually. And for myself, I think this is where it leads to us making a case for 3D printing and bringing the value of autologous bone grafting to a higher level. So uh, I'm quite sure a lot of us are familiar with autologous bone grafting. I uh, won't explain it too much. Uh, in this particular publication's context, they are taking bone grafts from the ileum or the iliac crest. Uh, the objective is to assess the incremental costs. So these are not basic costs, but incremental costs and budgetary impact. And the idea is eventually to make informed decisions about surgical interventions. So before I go into explaining this chart again, let's orientate to this. Uh, on the left axis, you have clinical value from low to high. On the bottom, you have hospital added costs. Added costs are associated with OR time, 
length of stay complications, as well as acquisition costs for supplementary material. So based on the kind of materials that they looked at in this publication, uh, they have rated autographs as being very high in clinical value, but at the same time, there are high additional costs. Um, allographs fall in this zone here. Growth factors, depending on uh, what kind of growth factors we use and in what clinical scenario, they fall in a slightly this neutral zone. And uh, synthetic bone fillers, according to them, uh, with those, those are the ones with no structure, have uh, less clinical value and less uh, hospital added cost as compared to the rest. Now, um, so this idea of clinical value versus cost uh, based on their research is that they find that the autograph is not free. Why? Because there are incremental costs that come from donor site morbidity. So you have minor complications like seroma dysthesia. You have major complications that arise from deep infection and uh, fracture requiring repair. There are also supplementary material costs that are required during the bone harvesting process. Uh, last but not least, I think the patient experience is not great at 24 weeks or 52 weeks where they still experience pain. So I think the question for all of us, especially in the industry, is how can we uh, as AM manufacturers help to balance the entire healthcare ecosystem? How can we reduce the overall burden on all parties of the ecosystem? And I think we have to look at both the hospital and the patients, the surgeons, as well as the regulations. So revisiting what uh, the group of authors had published earlier, that's where I feel additive manufacturing can play a key role, both in terms of uh, design, in terms of function, and in terms of deriving clinical outcome. Uh, I think having additive manufactured products may have the potential to bring some of these categories of uh, existing surgical techniques and maneuvers into a high clinical value and low added cost to the hospital. So I think the question would be what uh, Osteopor has done with respect to this area. So we are still a small company, but we have uh, we are trying to be thoughtful in our approach. Um, we work collaboratively with hospitals and universities, and we are happy to say that we have reached the milestone of 40,000 implants globally. So these are mostly in the cranial facial reconstruction area, but we have started to venture out into some of the special cases uh, where the patients don't really have good options. So I'll share that in the next slide. Um, in terms of function, I think uh, we are interested and we are committed to providing regenerative implants that provide holistic patient care uh, and including pre-surgical and post-surgical care. Last but not least, we also have three published 10-year uh, retrospective reviews that show and demonstrate the clinical outcomes that allow our patients to live confidently. I think this is a snapshot of what we have achieved over the years. Um, on the top left panel, you will see this uh, Australian man that had his entire tibia reconstructed. Uh, there was 36 centimeters worth of bone. Uh, we 3D printed an implant, combined it with bone graft, and eventually he was able to walk two years after surgery. Uh, on the bottom left, you see a 120 kilogram German male uh, that had 15 centimeters of bone removed from his tibia. Uh, four months after surgery, he was able to ambulate six months, you see full integration from the proximal to, to distal end. And at 10 months, he was able to return back to work. Uh, and this last uh, newspaper clipping was actually done in Singapore, where a Vietnamese patient had extensive craniofacial deformities, and we were able to provide our 3D regenerative implants to help reconstruct the patient's face. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jing. That was uh, very informative and uh, very eye-opener, really, to see that you've done 40,000 implants worldwide. So all the success to Osteopoint and the good work that you're doing, and we are really proud of uh, um, a startup from Singapore going you know, uh, global. Fantastic. So keep going. Um, so talking about global, uh, we have a speaker from California coming in next. Um, that, uh, he's Dr. Ellen Dang. He's the chief medical officer and co-founder of Printer Press, the first manufacturing company in the world dedicated to helping create more ideas for medical devices and delivering them to the market in a shorter period of time. He's a board certified orthopedic spine surgeon. He's an innovator. He's a scientist. His, exp his expertise and interests include clinical applications and 3D printing, computational surgery, and optimizing conditions for spine fusion and bone healing. To share more about what a foundry concept of 3D printed medical implant design 
uh, and Manufacturing is here, Dr. Alan Deng. Alan? Thank you, Mahindra. Let me share my screen for a moment. Great. So my name is Alan Deng, and uh, I am an Associate Clinical Professor of Spine Surgery, but today I'm talking to you from the perspective of my company, uh, Printer Press, and I'll be talking about a foundry model for additive manufacturing of medical devices. So what we are, we are a medical foundry. And what that means is that we take 3D printing and combine it with nanotechnologies in a foundry ecosystem to help develop medical devices from concept to volume production. I like to start this talk with a number, 31 million. 31 million US dollars or 42 and a half million Singaporean dollars, if you will. We all know that that's a lot of money, but what does that really look like? Well, if we were traveling, we might visit Changi Terminal 3 and see the retail space, which is 20,000 square meters. Or if natural beauty is something you prefer, you could visit the Shiseido Forest Valley at the Chul Changi. And then think about the $10 bill that might be in your pocket. You could cover the entire Terminal 3 shopping area in Forest Valley completely with the layer of these $10 notes and still have a half million dollars left to spend. And the reason that 42.5 million Singaporean is an important number is that this is the average cost it takes to develop a single 510k device from concept to FDA clearance. And this number isn't made up, it actually is from a survey of over 200 medical technology companies with independent data analysis and verification by PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they do say that for a low to moderate risk 510k product, it's about 31 million US dollars. And the higher risk class three or PMA products can be approximately $94 million in costs. And this is part of the reason why if you're developing an implant, you first start with some design and decide in terms of software and hardware to use. You need to go somewhere to figure out where to prototype it. Just because it's prototype doesn't mean it's actually ready for a production build and you spend some time there. Figure out how to validate the entire process, including the packaging and sterilization. And after all this work, when you go to the FDA, they tell you you've made a mistake and you have to start from the beginning. And really, 31 million US underestimates the true cost because there's an infrastructure cost that's there, as well as the production ramp up at the end. At Printer Press, in the last year, we've developed six devices in that low to moderate FDA class two development and taken it from concept to 510K. And although the math would suggest that it would take us 254 million Singaporean to do this, we did it in just 4 million Singaporean. And this is part of the reason why we have a very distinguished team with experts in manufacturing and business, medical and regulatory expertise, software and data, and a very distinguished board of advisors. If you look at our team, they come from MIT, Stanford, UCSF Berkeley, and people from industry such as 3D Systems, Abbott, and Medtronic. But probably the most exciting part is if you look at our team, we have people coming from L'Oreal, the cosmetics company, in their engineering division. We have people from Tesla, Applied Materials and Ultratech, semiconductor manufacturing companies, and even people affiliated with Ferrari. If you think about this old approach, when you get a team of creative individuals and studies the problem of FDA development, you realize that the key point you have to understand is that the FDA is not the finish line. You have to start with the FDA to understand the requirements, to do things like the design history files and design controls. What you can then do is to bring your prototyping and build in the same environment. And this lets you identify the optimal printing processes and anything you do to make your prototype better actually can translate into making your finished device better. At that same concept, you want to bring your design in the same environment as the prototyping and building because you can design for manufacturing. This means that the engineering can be done within the known performance envelope of the manufacturing technology that exists. And as you can imagine, if you bring everything together, now you design for the FDA and you design for manufacturing and your iteration is very quick because you have clinicians, engineers, and manufacturing all under one integrated roof. The validation actually is part of printer press, but we keep them isolated to main integrity of the process. At printer press, we've developed six concurrently developed devices that are spine implants with two graph window designs. If you will, it could be three implants with two different designs, however you look at it. 
but there are over 400 SKUs that are involved in this system. And we do more than just print. To make this a FDA 510 cleared device, we have to develop a print quality management system. All our facilities have ISO 13485. You have to know what the FDA needs in terms of paperwork and documentation. And once you know what they need, you actually have to write the documentation. Our FDA folder is over 40 gigabytes worth of templates. You need instrumentation, validating the mechanical performance of implants, sterilization, and packaging. Your implant has to handle rough handling, whether it's being delivered by truck, plane, or boat. And all of these together, with our FDA expertise, really helped us develop six implant systems all concurrently. Yes, we do share design elements, documentation, instrumentation, processes, and validation. But we did six implants, not for the price of one. We did six for the price of one-tenth. And this really represents our technology and core platform. We do have a complete FDA regulatory platform, but it's backed by a data-driven manufacturing and technology world. And with manufacturing data, we can have a design optimization and flexibility to allow for better macroscopic and microscopic lattices, really to support body types of all people, not just the 50 percentile American white male, and decrease our time to prototype and manufacture. On the technology side, we have active R&D on nano coatings, surface modulations, nano etching and nanometrology, and really leveraging our semiconductor expertise and bringing clean room technology to additive manufacturing. And again, by defining the design and manufacturing envelope, you increase your efficiency. This lets you create devices previously not thought possible with mechanics more close to native bone. And we also leverage new inventions to technologies and license technologies out of universities. What we really have is a vertically integrated design that goes end to end from concept to FDA submission, backed by data and experience. Very importantly, we are an open hardware and software environment. We are not owned by a printer manufacturer. And so we actually have multiple printers in metal from multiple manufacturers, and the same thing is true for our software. And we truly have a distinguished team. But what makes us a medical foundry? So far, it sounds like I'm just a printer uh, printing service or a medical device company. Well, I told you it costs us about 4 million Singaporean to do this. What makes us a foundry is that if you wanted to do it, it's only going to cost you a million. And that's because our partners benefit from everything that we learn. Everything that we learn is passed on to our customers to enhance their device and to decrease their time to market. We started in 2018 and established a Singapore presence in 2019, and we have partnerships with the leading innovation centers in those areas. This allows for a future of designed in Singapore, made in Singapore, but also designed in Singapore and made in the USA, or better stated, designed globally and manufactured at Printer Press globally. What we are is truly a technology company that intersects four different innovations. Metal 3D printing is one, particularly titanium. And what we have expertise in is transferring devices from one manufacturer to another, from 3D systems to Renishaw to EOS. And this really gains competitive advantage and lowers the manufacturing risk. We're investing in new materials such as Peak and PEC to allow for 3D printed latticed Peak and PEC devices for the appropriate clinical indications. We have regulatory and IP ex expertise specifically focused on 3D printing and the US FDA and nanotechnology investments leveraging the innovations from the semiconductor world and applying it to the medical world. As a foundry, different companies come to us for different reasons. A startup or academic center may use every single capability that we have at Printer Press, whereas a larger multinational company may choose to do a joint development or subcontract specific components to us, use this for latticing or NPI, and we may not be a primary manufacturer or a secondary manufacturer. As you heard from tonight, there are even institutions like the Mayo Clinic that truly act more like a medical device company, and we can provide support to even those organizations. So in summary, what we do is we provide a complete end-to-end -end development and FDA submission pipeline. We have strong partnerships across the global innovation ecosystem, and truly what makes us a technology company is our proprietary IP to deliver performance that other service bureaus simply cannot produce. And we have a team that's combining clinical experts, 
semiconductor manufacturing and additive man experts as well. We've only been around for two years and we've actually changed our logo once. But I also will share a secret with you and what our logo means and we've always believed in fast forwarding additive manufacturing to help others. There are many more secrets at Printer Press including about our logo but I thank you for your time and I wish that we were traveling to Singapore and perhaps next year I'll see everyone there. Thank you. Alan, thank you so much. Uh, yes, well, thank you for sharing your secrets with us. And I think there's many more secrets to unravel through our conversations. And I, and I think what you mentioned earlier about uh, design in Singapore and manufacture in Singapore is truly what we are hoping for with all these collaborations that we hope to have with the likes of Printer Press and, uh, and even Mayo Clinic and all the other partners that we have around the world. I think that's how we are trying to grow the ecosystem for the 3D printing for the healthcare also in Singapore. So thank you for all the support and all the interest. And for sure, we will get over this pandemic and we will see you in Singapore in the near future, for sure. Until then, we will just continue having all these virtual calls. It works very well, right? So let's get on with exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's doing well. So um, yeah, on that note, uh, I'd like to introduce a, the next speaker who's right here from Singapore, a very uh, energetic young man who has been pushing also the boundaries of 3D printing. He co-founded and assumed the role of the Chief Scientific Officer at De Novo Sciences in 2014. He's so passionate in bridging the gaps in personal care industry uh, after the bans of animal testing that happened and so um, for the cosmetic industry. So. And then so he went into directing De Novo Sciences to provide alternative methods that is more accurate and has high reproducibility. He is a serial entrepreneur uh, who accepts challenges and transforms them into business opportunities. So and he nurtures and creates an environment to encourage learning and personal growth. And learning is continuous and never ending that he says. So uh, let's hear what he has to say more about advancement in skin 3D printing for commercial use. Here is MJ. Right. Hi. Thanks. Thank you, 3D, uh, 3D Hills and also Nami for inviting me here to uh, speak a little bit on my work itself. So I'm, I know I'm the second last speaker for today, so I should keep it short <laughs> and sweet. Okay, I hope that you guys can hear me well. I'm going to share my screen now. All right. Cool. Okay. So, okay. Uh, thank you for the intro just now. And you helped me to speak a little bit more about my uh, introduction for my slide as well. Because as you know, skin is often related to cosmetic. Okay, skin testing is one part of big things for cosmetic. And in 2014, okay, cosmetic really banned testing on animal in Europe. And all this thing has started to come to Asia, to US, slowly one by one country also vow for it. And also has anti-animal uh, animal testing clause within them as well. So this made things very interesting for us. At the start out, we have in vitro skin technology, but all this is done manually. So now there's a gap. The gap is to provide animal testing, but it's alternative. Alternative animal testing, animal free solution that we're looking for. So the gap is in between what we have now using animal to human. So, okay, so what the normal sciences do, we try to provide a one source solution, okay? using in vitro skin technology to replace animal, okay, for all the testing services that we do. So there's no animal uh, use in our uh, testing and all this thing is to be done using something we call human relevance, more biologic human relevance. So in vitro skin definitely is one of it and it's a very big thing and our core technology for de novo sciences is not only making the skin, we also have an organoid technology that can be made other epithelial model or even liver, which, which we are going to do further on later on. So our USP also binds on the Asian origin concept because based in Singapore, we have population of Chinese, we have Malay, we have Indians. So this gives us a good range of skin that we can get and use it to form skin of different ethnicity. So application wide, our today for today's topic it will be only a cos cosmetic. So I came across 3D bioprinting, I think three, four years back. And I think uh, it's very nice that Chao Sing introduced me about this bioprinting things and things, and also collaborator that I can work with, with NTU side as well. So eventually, why is there a need for 3D bioprinting? We are doing all the skin manually. Big companies, our competitor in the Europe and the US, Metat Skin, 
then Epic Skin, they are all using in vitro, they are all making manufacturing in vitro skin, but none of them are using 3D bioprinting. So there's, there's a technology gap over there, and the need is very simple. There's a cosmetic ban on animal testing. That's why there's a need for in vitro model that is resembling to human. So that's the reason why there's a craze of in vitro skin that people are using it for testing. So what kind of area that it can be used for application-wide, I will go through later on. But the need is there. And we all know that Apple Skin L'Oreal site is collaborating with Organov to do 3D bioprinting as well. So all this thing is just hinged out to the point that everyone is going to do bioprinting because there's a big demand for this. So in, in cosmetic testing, there's a lot of things we can look into it. You see, um, everything that we apply on the skin, you have to go be absorbed into the skin. That's one thing. That's more into permeation. Once it absorbs in the skin, you, you might want to know something. Does it cause irradiation? Does it have the function, the efficacy that it's still having? So all these things are questions that we ask in the cosmetic industry. So how can this individual skin play a role? So this is a collaboration we do in 2017 under support of NAMI, who give us a grant to develop this bioprinting skin. So this is a very exciting technology. We're using region who a bioprinter as well, and collaborating with the NTU group, Prof. Yong Wai Yi itself. So in last year, late last year, we are um, <clears throat> interviewed by this writer's group, reported this about bioprinting. So this is a very exciting technology, but I want to say, although this has been done and successfully printed a skin, but there's still a lot of question marks on the skin itself. Whether is the skin biofunction able? So we are looking to not just making a skin, but we are looking into creating a skin that is functional. That is most important, is functional skin. So what we do, okay, we printed the keratinocytes and fibroblasts onto, the, onto the, our methodology. So using 3D bar printing. So we are managed to get them into a cold culture methods that can support both sides. And after that, we go them for 14 days for ensure stratification. So what we get is really a 3D bar printed skin. But now the question is, this is similar to what we do in manual work, okay? but we are using the 3D bioprinting technology to mimic the whole thing to meet the printer skin. Now we have the skin. So what we need to do is application wise, because what to us, a skin that has no application, has no functional, is useless. So what we want to make is a skin that is functional. So that is important. The first step that we do is biological efficacy evaluation. So we're looking for things that provide the information about its function, the biological function of it. As you know, skin is widely, for in a skin cosmetic area, a lot of people do anti-aging testing. So a lot of product has been wanted to do anti-aging testing. So we're using this bioprinted skin and do a little bit of this efficacy checking on anti-aging using a very standard vitamin C conception. Everyone know that vitamin C increases collagen production. So this is one important part. And vitamin C also uh, helps in antioxidant as well. So using this anti-aging process, we use it to use on the in vitro skin, on the 3D printer skin, and we found that yes, 3D printer skin has an effect. It has managed to give an effect of anti-aging. So it shows that the skin that was printed is functional in biological terms. It is relative to effect on anti-aging and, and antioxidant as well. So another big part of in vitro skin, which commonly used in all cosmetic industry, is for in vitro OECD approved tests. So what we call this is irritation or corrosion test. OECD 439, OECD 431. That is what the cosmetic company is following. And they are all using in vitro skin to do it for the testing itself. So how does it play a role? So this is very easy to know that all cosmetic product, whether it's active ingredient, final formulation, everyone wanna know whether is it irritation, is there irritation potential that it will cause to the human when they apply to it itself. Or before you go for clinical testing, is it safe enough to be used on human? So this is the first benchmark of toxicology information that is going to put into your safety data sheet to let people know that, okay, your finished product, your active ingredient, they are safe to use, able to test it on human as well. So this is the first batch. And what we test from our result itself, that this skin is, has, uh, is not so, close to individual skin that we are making in-house in the manual method. So it's lacking a little bit. It is much more sensitive than the one that we are making. So all this points out to perhaps it has a lash, um, because you know skin, 
there's a lot of parts of skin. One thing is that it's functional. The other thing is that about the barrier. The barrier of skin is the most important. It can up all the waters and protect you from the external environment as well. So perhaps this layer of barrier, skin barrier that we have, we call it stratum corneum, is not formed enough. It's not properly formed as well. That's why it gives a lot more sensitivity to the skin that it reacts to irritants as well. So that is one thing that we found out. And the other thing, in the cosmetic industry, not only in cosmetic, I would say in, also in any topical application uh, industry, like example for pharma side, they have patch that is, drug, that is filled with drugs and all this thing. All they want to know is pharmacokinetics or cosmetic ingredient. They want to know whether things can penetrate into the skin. So at the same time, this is called permeation. Okay, penetration of active ingredient into the skin. And that is one key thing is used by the pharmaceutical side and also cosmetic side using uh, this OECD 428 testing. So we also do the same thing. We use the 3D printed skin as well. We put it on this vertical deficient cell system, which is known as also friend cell system. And we run through penetration tests to look at the permeability of the barrier as well. Similarly, the result that we show is simple. It doesn't have a very good um, barrier function because things can penetrate easily. Looking at a zero hour, things really start to penetrate. So this is something to tell us that, okay, our 3D printed skin, although we have it, is biological functioning, but the barrier is lacking. So this is something that calls to think about. So what is the kind of development that we can look for in the next step that we're going to move forward? One thing is what we found out is we need to enhance the barrier. Definitely, we need to enhance the barrier to make it structurally more similar to human because with a good barrier of skin, it can help us to better mimic what is going to happen in the human body as well. Second thing, okay, I'm I'm pretty new in this 3D bioprinting area as well. Then I realized that the cost of the equipments, the bio inks, all these are very expensive. Although we are using collagen, but the cost and the throughput is rather small and it's rather costly as well. So there's something that I think that we can work towards it together. And the other thing is to enhance reproducibility. We spoke to a lot of people about printing skin. A lot of company has done print printed skin as well. So the key problem they also face is about reproducibility. Is it every piece of skin you print will be similar? So that is something that we need to know as well. So as a whole, I think there's a lot more ways to go forward. But I think it's a very good stepping stone for bioprinting field that we are able to print something that is functional. It's maybe not to what we are thinking yet, but I think that's something that the whole ecosystem can help out and accelerate this development into a better skin as well. All right. So this is something that I, in the normal what we were wanting to do, and now we are embarking on the uh, liver testing as well, uh, li <coughs> sorry, liver printing as well. And we're also researching on the lungs and intestinal model as well. So this is something that what we want to do, we want to replace the whole animal for testing, not only for cosmetic, but we want to use it for pharmaceutical as well and food nutrition industry as well. So what we try and create to replace the whole animal with all the vital organs, with all, all the raw entry organs as well, to be inside there to have a system on the chip form set. So this is our vision that our Dinova Sciences and we shall accomplish that in the coming years as well. Right, thanks. This is my presentation. All right. MJ, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that very insightful presentation. That was really great. Um, yeah, and the good stuff that you're doing. And uh, I think there are some questions for you as well. We'll try to take it at the end of the session. Right, uh, you know, final <laughs> distinguished speaker for today is uh, Professor Paul Ho. He's a professor at the Faculty of Science, Pharmacy Department, National University of Singapore. He's also a trust lead in NUS Center for Additive Manufacturing. And he's contributing a lot to 3D printing for pharmaceutical applications. His current research interests on pharmacokinetics and formulations of CNS medicines in 2011, he was awarded the mentor of the Outstanding Graduate Student Research Award in Pharmaceutical Technologies by the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists in Washington, DC. And in the same year, he won the Outstanding Scientist Award by the Faculty of Science, uh, National University of Singapore. The Prof. Ho is also an honorary professor at Si'an si Jiao Tong University. My Chinese is not so good, but <laughs> he's a professor there. And uh, Prof. Paul Ho, please with your presentation on 3D printing in medicines, the present and the future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for waiting and the uh, introductions. Uh, today, I would like to share with you on 3D printed medicines, the present and the futures. Uh, you may take a look on the title that there is a present and there is a future, but uh, there is no past. In fact, uh, um, 3D printed medicine is a, is a very new and 
really there is no pass and it is still under development. And uh, uh, after uh, today's uh, many excellent uh, presentation, all of you would be very familiar with uh, 3D paintings. And uh, what would be the advantages of using 3D paintings uh, for medicines? In fact, uh, there are many uh, applications. One, it allows a uh, rapid prototyping for first in human clinical trial. And usually for the first in human clinical trial, uh, we don't need um, uh, many uh, uh, dosage uh, forms. And the second advantage would be it allows those uh, flexibility. It is uh, particularly important for pediatric and uh, geriatric uh, 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 populations. And the third advantage is that it can reduce the uh, labor and resource investment because of the materials involved in the manufacturing will be much less than the uh, whole batch uh, manufacturing uh, conventionally. And then the fourth advantage is that uh, uh, it is the uh, most important. It allows on-site preparation. Uh, this means that we can integrate both of uh, those formulations into clinical practice. And um, so far, there is only one 3D printed uh, print medicine in the market. Uh, that is uh, um, um, approved by FDA in 2016. Uh, it is called uh, Spiltem. Uh, it is a laboratory symptom uh, uh, medication. Uh, it is used uh, for epilepsy. And uh, this uh, uh, Spiltem is uh, printed with a, a technology called Terrifast. Basically, it is an uh, 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 approach uh, to fuse the powder together. And uh, uh, in the tablet, it has uh, the bundle region and also the powder regions. And this is the technology used for the 3D printing process. And layer of layers of powder is uh, filled by the binding liquid. And uh, what are the advantage of a terrible fast, uh, um, um, fast disintegration system? That's uh, the tablet being uh, produced. The main advantage of uh, this uh, uh, printed medicine is that uh, it has a fast disintegration uh, time. And it is also a uh, uh, rapid prototyping technologies. And uh, based on these uh, uh, technologies, the tablet can be disintegrated in, in, second, in just a few seconds. And the other advantage is that it allows uh, high drug loadings. It can um, print up to uh, one gram per tablet. And the, the patient can take this uh, uh, tablet uh, uh, without using waters. And, uh, Unfortunately, this uh, system is still not decided for personalized uh, uh, medicines. And uh, when we compare the, um, these uh, 3D printed uh, tablets with a uh, conventional tablet, uh, basically they have the same uh, pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical properties. Uh, the CMS, TMS, and bioavailability are comparable to the conventional dosage form. Therefore, the only advantage of uh, this uh, 3D printed uh, dosage form is the fast disintegration and the administration does not require water. And uh, in fact, uh, there is uh, one limitation of uh, this approach is that uh, it is not particularly suitable for drugs that have uh, bitter tastes. Therefore, there are still a lot of room for uh, development in 3D printed medicines. Um, there are the areas uh, such as uh, uh, developing new materials for paintings, uh, identifying new uh, application uh, of the technology, and also as um, establishing novel printing platform for pharmaceutical manufacturing. Currently, there are five main um, uh, 3D printed technologies uh, available in the market, and uh, uh, all of them have been exported for the um, manufacturing or, or for the printing of uh, medicines. Uh, they are the binder jet printing. Uh, it is a, a, a similar to the uh, Terrifast uh, platform. We also have a field uh, disposition modeling um, and the other, the third one is a semi-solid extrusion, and the fourth one is a selective laser sintering, and then the last one is a steel lithography printing. And all of this has the pro and cons uh, in, in the technologies for pharmaceutical applications. And this one uh, I would like to share with you is the uh, inkjet printed medicines. And it, uh, we can print uh, tablets with a uh, different pore size in the tablets. And the, Drug release rate can be controlled by the pore size of the tablet. And, um, and the, the solid tablet will have a much slower drug release rate, and the, the more porous the tablet will have a faster uh, release rate. And then the next one is called extrusion based uh, 3D pin printer. And basically, we use a cartridge of a semi solid matrix for the printing. 
And uh, with uh, these technologies, uh, people have uh, 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 produced a very uh, uh, com uh, complicated uh, structure of a tablet. And within one tablet, it has a uh, uh, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, and anti-diabetic drugs all in one tablet. Therefore, with uh, this uh, uh, kind of a formulation, it can help to improve uh, uh, patient compliance. But so all these uh, uh, approaches, they have uh, all the advantages and disadvantages. Such as uh, for the FDM printer, uh, it requires high temperature for printing. Therefore, it is not particularly suitable for thermal labor drug. And then for the inject uh, based printer, uh, there are concerns of a residual solvent in the printer medicines. And also the drug may not be stable in the semi-solid matrix. And then for the, the other one, uh, stereolithographic printer, um, uh, with uh, this technology, the, the matrix is uh, exposed to UV light for polymer polymerization. And uh, in this case, uh, some drugs may not be stable on UV, expo UV light exposure. Therefore, um, according to one review article, that the ideal uh, CV printer for pharmaceutical manufacturers, one, it has to be cost effective. Uh, it should allow uh, uh, a stability of the printer medicines. It should be user friendly, and also it is efficient. And it is uh, versatile in the application. And and last one, and it is uh, the safety of the um, of the printer medicine. And according to the will, and also I agree that um, it is clear that it is clear that the ideal CD printer for personalized personalized medicine has not yet been developed. And uh, what is uh, the status uh, from the regulatory authorities? In fact, um, in uh, 2017, uh, FDA released a guidance uh, titled uh, Technical Consideration for Additive Manufacturing um, uh, Medical Device. Uh, it is for medical device, it is not for pharmaceutical yet. And also the uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research established um, an emerging technology team to examine and advance application for new technologies, including 3D, pin, uh, 3D printing. In this case, uh, you, uh, you may see the regulatory authority is uh, ready to accept or uh, to evaluate, or at least to evaluate uh, 3D printing for pharmaceutical application. And then in 2015, uh, FDA issue a draft guidance entitled Advancement of Emerging Technologies Application to Modernize the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Base. Uh, you may be aware that the Conventional uh, technology used for um, pharmaceutical manufacturing, especially for tablet is in fact it is a century old technology. And um, everything can be changed. I believe that in the near future, CD printing will have a big application um, on pharmaceutical man uh, manufacturing, especially for uh, personalized medicine. And the ideal uh, CD printing materials for pharmaceutical uh, application um, they should be uh, safe and it has a suitable ph pharmaceutical property um, uh, uh, that is a, a suitable for painting. Uh, it has to be inexpensive and also it does not have a high melting point that is a, but it is high enough to remain as a solid uh, during storage. And then the last one is uh, it can kill and solidify immediately after painting. And it is uh, better to eliminate the post painting processing. And the ideal uh, 3D printed process for pharmaceuticals, it has to be safe, simple, safe, but uh, uh, from, uh, from your understanding, uh, it may not be scalable. And uh, this is a statement from the Center Drug Evaluation and Research. And uh, they have uh, put down a guideline on the future uh, technologies on pharmaceutical, on 3D printing. And they um, stated that uh, we are helping to advance effort on 3D printing of uh, drug products while applying the same scientific rigors for safety and effectiveness that patients have to come to expect from FDA. In other words, the, the control of a 3D, uh, 3D printed medicine will not be uh, different from the conventional pharmaceutical products. In this case, uh, uh, when for whatever uh, 3D printer uh, developed for pharmaceutical um, uh, manufacturing, especially for personalized medicines, they have to follow the same rigor in the quality control and pharmaceutical control as uh, the conventional uh, platform. 
it looks like to be a real challenge. But I believe that uh, everything that we can imagine is real. And um, with uh, the new technologies, uh, I foresee in the future, uh, a special, uh, a special um, um, designed uh, 3D printer for uh, personalized medicine will be available in the market and also in the clinical sector in the future. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Paul Ho. Yes, um, we've pretty much uh, come to the end of this session. I mean, we, we had so much content today and uh, very lovely speakers with a lot of uh, very insightful uh, secrets, as uh, Ellen Dang was saying. Uh, so we will quickly jump into the Q&A session of this. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions that have been asked and we had already uh, answered those live. Uh, the speakers had been writing to you on, on those questions that you've asked. And so maybe uh, well, let's kick off this uh, session. I mean, we, it's going to be, it's an open forum. All of you can jump in and uh, if there's something that you wanted to say earlier on in your presentation and you didn't. So please uh, feel free to share us uh, those thoughts now. Uh, but I, I've got a quick question for Jenny, who is, um, uh, you know, the founder of 3D Heels. So I think everybody wants to know also, I mean, you have made a quick presentation earlier. Now, what, what is really your story? What motivates you to dive deeper into 3D printing and like how you've embraced it? And I know what, what is the vision and what are you trying to achieve through all of this? And I think this is, this is a big general question for all our speakers here today as well. Um. Well, when I first encountered 3D printing, it was a magical moment uh, because, you know, I'm a radiologist. I interact with digital information all the time. But that was the first time I ever interacted with a product that's made of digital information that's identical of a human body parts. So that is when I felt, you know, that was a wow moment there. But eventually, I think um, perhaps it, it's, it's part of my personality is I, I want to do something more beyond just day-to-day -day clinical practice, which is as satisfying, but I wanna do something more impactful. And over the years, you know, uh, through my activities with 3D Heels, I realized that working with entrepreneurs, discovering innovators is the most fun thing to do. Uh, and through that, I, I can also make a really deep impact, you know, supporting founders, talk to founders, um, talk to startups, companies, innovators, early adopters, to see what kind of help they need. Um, do they need um, you know, regulatory network or legal advice or founding sources? You know, um, I feel like I'm actually moving the needle just a tiny bit and that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much the kind of thing that uh, also NEMIC is uh, trying to do here. I mean, we're trying to move the needle through our, our ecosystem of uh, partners and researchers here as well. So. Um, we are aligned on that. Um, so I, I'm going to just quickly jump into a uh, to to Dr. Morris as well. So uh, what I mean, we've seen what you've done at Point of Care at the uh, at the Mayo. Um, I think uh, you know uh, Dr. Tu from the SGH was also saying earlier on that you know we are not really where you are. Um, so maybe some thoughts on that and how we can also uh, you know get to that kind of. Um, uh, service that we can provide to the healthcare uh, uh, sector here? I think we've really tried hard to find applications where it's truly beneficial. And like when I was watching um, one of the earliest speakers at a timeline, and a lot of people say, well, anatomic models and guides are kind of something that's been done for a long time. And like many technologies say, well, why isn't it the standard of care? Why isn't it reimbursable? Why isn't every hospital? Um, manufacturing at scale. You know, we do 75,000 surgeries in the hospital I'm sitting in every year, and yet we only touch 2,000 patients. So while all the factors are correct and what, what speakers say, it still isn't the standard of care across our country. And part of this um, is because the, the difficulty that still is to actually do this at scale. And uh, I was just typing a note to, to Alan, as a matter of fact, because some of the things he's done is create this foundry platform to create these turnkey solutions that somebody can come to because they just don't exist in the marketplace. So I think having local champions at each individual hospital, and you certainly have assembled a number here, 
that have just embraced the technology and, and pushed it forward, whether it's congenital heart or orthopedics um, or breast surgery. You know, it's all started with a local champion at their institution who's embraced the technology. And I think anybody who has that in any institution becomes a central hub of creation. And if you have a culture which is not, you know, every academic medical center in the United States does not have a culture of um, sharing all of their infrastructure with every single subspecialty. A lot of academic medicine around the world is steeped in siloed budgets and siloed reward systems. So I would say if you want it to really spread at your institution where it becomes a standard of care and we're, and we're advising our Arizona colleagues, so our Arizona campus is about to double in size. It's a $600 million investment. And if we're gonna service that with added manufacturing, then it has to be a central core infrastructure of the hospital that serves the entire hospital. And everybody has to buy into that vision. Um, but, you know, it still takes local champions to do this. We, we have a large infrastructure here that's grown over time and it's still difficult to perform this at scale. Um, so I think having people that are willing to take the technology forward, that are willing to make the sacrifices it takes, and then finally, we've gotten billing through the AMA, through the RSNA, um, 3D SIG, and through the American College of Radiology that we've gotten reimbursement codes through. There are only category three codes, um, which is also being tracked by the American College of Radiology um, uh, registry, but it has allowed people to start billing. So if you want something to be the standard of care in the United States, it's tied to a reimbursement code. Yeah. <laughs> Whether breast MR or cardiac angio or whatever, it's tied to a billing code. So um, we've worked hard to try and create that infrastructure. So I think those are a number of things that it's taken to really become the standard of care here, but most of it is, is based on the culture and a multidisciplinary environment and people that are willing to use it as a tool um, to make their hospital better. Mm. And, yeah, and I really like the statement of, um, the congenital surgery talk who said, you know, Singapore is a small country. They have a low volume of congenital heart surgery. So even, even we have that for our experts. Sometimes the experts are still only doing things three times a year, two times a year. So having these models to practice on, I mean, it's so beneficial. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I'm talking about that. Uh, I'm just going to just jump into one of the questions from Daniel, who is asking, uh, what are the various costs involved in setting up the various systems? Uh, just approximate figures would help. Anybody knows, uh, want to touch on that? I could talk about it for point of care manufacturing because we've done it. So um, it all, every, every question with 3D printing, just uh, the answer is it depends. So if you're selling up a small laboratory that say is going to do orthopedic bones, you know, um, you can get started for as easy as a $3,000 printer, some software and a small space and someone who's going to do the printing post-processing and you can get going, you know, if you consider your own FTE time for under a hundred thousand dollars. But if you're really going to go to scale for something like guides, for example, every geometry pattern we do worst case best case scenarios has to be independently validated that's fifteen thousand dollars there's batch contracts for resins um you know now you're into the more hundreds of thousands of dollars so the return on investment really has to be there for you to be doing the numbers you're doing mm -hmm. um, and then it all depends on what type of staff you have to hire if you're going into the uh, if you're like kaiser west and you're going to do an entire healthcare system well, you're gonna need engineers, CT tech, segmenters, people to run the printers, people to keep the post-processing going. You know, those are all technicians or machinist level uh, employees. So, uh, and then there's people that just do segmentation in-house and outsource the 3D printing. So they use service bureaus to outsource the 3D printing. Um, there's more of those around the country, I think, than any other um, way to start 3D printing. and. So there's blended approaches, there's all in-house, there's small in-house, there's large in-house. Mm. It, really, it really depends on the scale and scope of what you're going to be doing and how many surgical subspecialties you're going to take on um, in-house. And if you get into 
titaniums, which I think um, is probably best suited for industry outside of like large institutions, like a uh, hospital for special surgery has partnered with a medical device manufacturer to bring in house. We're bringing it in house, but I mean, just to get a printer in the door, you're starting at a million dollars. So, mm. uh, you know, it just doesn't, the, 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 the value proposition is not yep. there for most places. So that probably won't be something of scale. Yep. Okay, exactly. So I think it, it probably needs to be taken on a case by case basis. So uh, I hope that answers that questions uh, that are put across. Uh, I want to add a little bit. Um, yes, sure. Is that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we created a online calculator a couple of years ago for just hypothetical scenarios. It's definitely not as complicated um, as people wish they can be, and it. Mm -hmm. The calculators unfortunately stopped working, so we're gonna make that work again. So maybe people can check back our website and they can just plug in some numbers and then figure some ballpark stuff out. Yeah. And, the, and the cost has to be offset by the benefit. So if you're saving two hours at eighty dollars a minute in an OR, you know you're saving ten thousand dollars. If you're providing less trips back to the OR because you have less flat failures, all that cost has to be considered. Um, which is why you need someone with a big thinking idea when you're funding your process because the cost savings um, have to be attributed when you're doing this. Yep. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Kim Chong, uh, who is uh, asking, could 3D virtual modeling technology be fully adopted for final 3D printing of parts for the patient? And, and he, he mentions that AI has been reported to help doctors make less mistake, improved efficiency that can be integrated and adopted to improve 3D printing for final use in less cost and time. So virtual modeling technology, can it be fully adopted? I wonder if you think like AI can assist oh. 3D printing. I'm not really sure exactly what that question means, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I can tell you practically what we're doing with it. So we're using a number of segmentation algorithms to perform machine learning algorithms to reduce the segmentation time. So we spend a lot of time, as several of the speakers have said, doing segmentation. And if we can create machine learning trusted segmentation algorithms, which are different than the segmentation algorithms that are being mostly funded in the radiology community for diagnostic, um, you know, is this lung cancer responding to chemo? Is there a lung cancer? Is this brain tumor have a certain genetic um, deletion, which means it should get radiation. All those types of auto segmentation tools that are being developed in radiology don't really work for 3D printing because they don't pay attention to the surface morphology. So uh, some of the things we're doing is machine learned, machine learned algorithms to reduce the segmentation time, machine learned algorithms to reduce the time of guide design. Um, and then a lot of the other stuff is for diagnostics. Uh, certainly we wish uh, the printers would have some sort of machine learning inside of them so they weren't so finicky and had uh, greater uptime. But, you know, I'm sure the people at Printer Press can talk about the ability to dial in these machines, industrial machines at scale, so they have inter-printer reliability um, across several sites is not trivial, which, which is why you can't just go out and buy that. It all has to be dialed in locally by people who understand this technology. And um, if AI wants to help on that side, we'll take it. Yeah, and no, I think that's a, a good point in terms of, if you look at our team, um, you see a lot of computer chip or semiconductor manufacturing expertise. And what Dr. Morris said is absolutely true, that you can get a printer, and it doesn't matter if it's the hobbyist $3,000 printer or even a premium you know, $100,000 FDM printers. So you're not even trying to get something complex. The reliability of the $100,000 machine is better than the hobbyist one, but it's still not 100% reliable. In mm. contrast, think about the computer chip that's in your smartphone, the quantities and the volumes that need to be made, and how many of your smartphones actually go bad, or is it that you dropped your phone? So that level of reproducibility and precision is something that the semiconductor world has solved. And really, that's one of the reasons why Printer Press was started. So it was co-founded by two surgeons, my brother and myself. We're orthopedic surgeons in academia. Our uh, co-founders, one, our CEO, Shri, came from Applied Materials, which is one of the largest semiconductor equipment manufacturers. 
and our COO, Kishore, came from Apple, and he's very humble, but he ran iTunes operations when there were only four people at iTunes. And he reported directly to Eddie Q, and report, who reported to Steve Jobs. And really, you have to take that mindset of, you know, you can make an iPhone cost-effectively and reliably. And that's what we're taking the, that same approach towards medical manufacturing, particularly for titanium and advanced materials like peak and pack. And it's one of the things that's a barrier to the industry. Um, and it doesn't matter what vertical you're in, you know, we're on these panels with Boeing and Lockheed Martin and Ford and Porsche. It's this, it, everyone has the same exact problem. You know, scalability, reproducibility, uptime, reliability, and everyone is having to recreate the wheel in order to make this technology work to make all of those promises and advantages actually come to fruition at scale, which is why, you know, Stryker has 80 machines running in Cork, Ireland. Well, you can't just go replicate that. That's their IP, the entire, you know, from the powder to the way the laser's tuned to the post-processing. Um, and that's what makes, I think, printer press something that's very unique because all that special sauce that's been considered IP in the past is allowing to be shared across industry partners. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's really novel because most medical manufacturers will share nothing. Um, and certainly not what the FDA requires of them. So when you talk to the FDA and they say, well, what is your recommendation for a manufacturing of a PEC cranial implant? There's nothing. There's, you tell us what you're gonna do and then we'll tell you it's sufficient. There's no standardization, there's no ASTM documentation that you can say follow this for this material on this printer and this will be an FDA regulated product, right? They can go into four different hip manufacturers and have four different complete manufacturing processes that have four different quality management systems and they're all acceptable, but they'll never share that with anyone else and the FDA doesn't share that either. So I think, you know, democratizing that information is a, is a really good step forward. We have quite a lot of questions coming through. Uh, I know we are overrunning, but uh, so, and I know it's going to get to midnight soon for you, Jay, <laughs> in the U.S. So I'm going to try to keep this a uh, little bit tight. I'll quickly go into a question, which is really for the Singapore-based uh, speakers. Uh, and generally, if anyone else also wants to jump in, please do so. So he wants to know what is the current development in stem cell bioprinting for future downstream differentiation? If this is on, what kind of biomaterial is being used? Uh, can it maintain sterility and cell viability during printing? Yes, I, I, I do a little bit of this stem cell printing. Okay, then uh, generally I'm using collagen and laminin as well. So these two are the main things I use for the printing concept. And um, generally you can put the whole thing to be sterile inside the culture food, so shouldn't be a problem for that. It really depends on the machine yourself. The region food the system you're using is um, so-called is sterile, it's like in a BSC food. Then the smaller system all can place in the BSC food, so I don't think that will be a problem as well. So the in terms of differentiation property, it really depends. It depends on the, the differentiation medium they're using. Because the one that we're using, uh, like ESLs, uh, MSC cells, we are able to differentiate them to edibles, to bone, differentiate them to um, like a heart, cardiac muscle as well. So all these things can be done using different differentiation kit. So it's not a very tough process. So, um, but the key thing is. Are you able to get that, um, that tissue integrity at the end of the day? Is it, is it uh, in terms of physiological, in terms of like structure, do you get that when through the printing? Because eventually you still need the tissue, the cells, you know, to bind together, to hold them together, to have whole functional effect. It's not just looking at a piece of cells with cardiac muscle, look at, looking at them by pumping, it's not good enough. You have to look at the whole structure, way and how the cells and cells interact all these things together. So it's a lot of more things to investigate. That, like what I said about skin printing, it's not about just printing or something, but it must be functional. Mm, that's true. Okay. Um, what are the benefits and current and future potential of 3D printed patient specific implants? This is and what are your opinions on the effect on off-the-shelf implants? So, small question on the implants. Hi, Mandarin. It's Gavin here. Yes. And 
Yeah, I think uh, initially, as I sort of said at the beginning of my talk, the industry was very much focused on uh, absolute customization of things, in particular in relation to joint replacement and arthroplasty uh, in the early days. I think it's moved away from that to sort of semi-customizable and, and even the off-the-shelf uh, uh, devices that uh, we know work extremely well. What Dr. Morris has been talking about is slightly different in relation to bony reconstructions and tumors and large bone defects. Um, I think and what I'm particularly interested in, in the, the trauma side of things, I think there's really going to be a significant improvement in the potential for you know, healing capability, speed, function, recovery uh, in, that, in that area. I, I think as that develops and matures, it'll, it'll morph and, and uh, follow on into the, the elective uh, arthroplasty world of hip replacement, knee replacement, etc., to help with all the things we've heard people talking about with uh, increased bony integration, uh, semi-customized uh, implants, and mm. all being printed at that local, uh, either country or hospital level. Yeah. Gavin, yeah. so I can follow, sorry. Uh, well, one of the previous speakers said he had 40,000 implants around the world. You know, that's a pretty impressive number already for 3D printed creative access. And, and, and it, it, well, there's multiple things. It's like, it's like what Gavin just said, there's things for trauma, and benign entities where it's much easier to create custom implants um, for areas that are otherwise well fed with blood supply, don't have radiated skin. Um, but once you get into a lot of the oncologic uses, um, you know, the patients are going to be radiated many times. And most of this stuff does not stand up to 70 gray of radiation to the face, to the pelvis, to the hip. You know, a lot of it breaks down and then you have a loose implant which has to be removed in a in a bed that doesn't have normal vascularity so um, it's not so simple once you get into radiated implants and and there's also weight bearing implants versus non weight bearing implants so a cranial plate is very different than a hemisacrum implant you know um, but but there is a definite need um, for all of those things for benign implants for things that can hold up to standard a greater radiation I mean, if we could bioprint fibular free flaps, we wouldn't be taking them out of people's legs um, or their scapula, right? We would just be, they would just be in a biogenerator somewhere easy for us to pull from, much like the veins that are being developed. Yeah, just, just uh, on that, we have a, a relevant question here also to touch on with what we, both you and Gavin have just said. Uh, in terms of rehabilitation, you know, that forms part of the surgery is an integral part of any surgery. So can 3D printing actually play a vital role in rehab? So I, th I think definitely, you know, going forward to the next stage of a lot of these implants will be, uh, say, more personalized implants rather than custom made and whether we're going to be able to put uh, additional uh, devices to measure stress and strain and weight bearing and tolerance and movement in adjacent joints. That uh, will probably be the next stage of looking at the uh, customized rehab, healing, and um, bone integration, and recovery from surgery. So there's definitely a lot of potential in that area. And I know a lot of the, the research is, is, is focusing on that uh, area of, of using sensors in these implants, how to generate enough uh, energy to, to get the, the, the information from the sensor out to a smartphone or whatever else so that people can alter their, their rehab and their habits to, to mm -hmm. optimize their healing process. So yeah, it's definitely uh, it's coming further down the line though. Yeah. Well, you just touched on sensor. So someone is just asking, probably read your mind accurately, and he's asking, is there any industry progress of electrode printing or sensor printing integrated with biomedical devices that you know of? Uh, not, yeah. not that I'm aware of. I know, they're all, I know a lot of them are thinking about it, and they've all got uh, programs, and they're, they're searching for, for possible solutions, but I'm, I'm not aware of any of the large multinationals or, or SMEs that are, are actively uh, using it at, at present. Yeah. Yes, and I no, think it's, it's all, all about energy all basically in research, like you said. You know, we're putting strain sensors, pressure sensors, trying to figure out if this is going to fail, what loads make something fail. Those are all questions that people want. I mean, in the prosthetic market, it's certainly happening. People are applying sensors into the prosthetics, but in the implant market, it just hasn't happened yet. Um, so, so, something though that has happened in the implant market, for example, in spine. You know, there's been companies popping up that are using machine learning, augmented, you know, uh, artificial intelligence to predict, say, what's, um, you know, what's, what's true sagittal alignment in the spine and taking the kind of art out of what the bend in the, what the bend in the rod should be um, based on where the imp 
import of the CT data is. Um, and then 3D printing, um, maybe patient-specific uh, disk space, but not even, using, not even using 3D printing to make the device, but using machine learning and artificial intelligence to say what this device should look like using traditional milling for patient-specific screws and, and rods. And then it's a complete culture shift though when you do that because the surgeon then has to say, I'm gonna rely on you instead of on my eight years of training and 10 years of experience. And it's not a subtle hurdle. And I think, um, I think Alan could, could speak on it as an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, most orthopedic surgeons are using the same screw and plate they put in 10 years ago because they know it works, it works. And everything that comes along that says, this is better, this will be great. If you use this, um, you know, it's a very big cultural hurdle to overcome. Mm. Oh, can I add uh, something about the electronic stuff? Um, actually, uh, Dr. Agawala Shwita, I hope I said her name Shwita. right. Yes. She, she wrote a blog for us about um, bioelectrics with bioprinting. Um, and also recently I saw a news article on that. I'll, I'll forward to everybody once I found it. So I think people are thinking about using biocompatible materials for, uh, you know, bioelectrics. In, so implantable, mm. biocompatible, um, 3D printed devices. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just get, getting some congratulatory messages also to the team from uh, the, the nasal pharyngeal swab team, Dr. Ho Cha Singh, as well as uh, Dr. David Allen. Uh, so a lot of messages to you. So good work and uh, keep up the good work that uh, is coming through you. So uh, David, any, anything to touch on? Or uh, Dr. Ho, would you want to say something along that um, for the audience to touch on? No, nothing more for me. I think uh, David did a great job. Uh, it was a, a Singapore in-output from everyone. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Allen, thank you very much. So uh, there's uh, another very uh, specific technical question here on uh, any application that has been used with ceramics 3D printing that you know of, uh, uh, really uh, for medical applications. Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. And there's an extra level of uh, technical difficulty around printing the ceramics and uh, the time that it takes to, to cure the ceramics even after the printing is, is quite significant. Uh, they're used extensively uh, in, in articulations in some of the orthopedic implants, um, but uh, it hasn't quite reached the stage where they're being replaced by, by 3D printed uh, ceramics as yet. Uh, the next stage will probably be some form of bone void fillers, um, which are, are uh, currently used and, and using the ceramics to try and uh, optimize, optimize mm. those. But it's a, more of a technical challenge, I think, on the production rather than the unwillingness to use it. Yeah, okay. So from ceramics to, uh, I think there's, there's a group of questions here in regards to implants. Uh, currently, there's uh, materials that is being used as uh, metal. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Morris, you're using a lot of that as well. So question here for, for the team, uh, can polymers replace metal implants? And if so, uh, how effective could they be? Well, I think it depends, right? Again, sorry to keep saying that, but you know, are you talking about weight bearing, non weight bearing? You're talking about the load that a pedicle screw and rod has to be placed. Like some people have been using carbon, you know, there's been people experimenting with carbon fiber rods and screws to replace titanium. Um, I sure as heck hope sometime that we can replace titanium because I can tell you, as, as a neuroradiologist who treats spine tumors, um, once you take parts of the body out and put a bunch of metal in there, it's really hard for us to see the recurrence of a tumor. And it certainly is really hard for us to go back in there and operate or work around all this metal. So um, for certain things in the head, like titanium plates and cranial plates and, you know, zygomatic maxillary plates, I think um, materials are already placing um, titanium. But um, beyond just the cultural difficulties it is, I mean, we've had replacements before for sacrectomies, for iliac sacrectomies out of other materials that were, do, that were produced with traditional milling and they didn't work out. So you have a large field of oncologic surgeons who have developed ways to put the body back together who are very hesitant to then say, hey, this polymer shows all the same strain and strength and tensile strength and maybe better why don't you put it in the pelvis next time? We've got 510K clearance. I think, I think 
they're really resident to do that. And, and I think, so for some applications, it's already happening. For other applications, um, people are slowly evaluating it. Um, and particularly for tumors, um, anytime you put metal inside the body, when we're looking, is the tumor back, which is what we do every six months to a year, um, is very difficult on MRI and CT because of all the artifacts. So if we can come up with things that can replace them, it will be great. Okay. Yeah, and I think to add to that, there will always be a role for, you know, if you look at traditionally manufactured implants in the spine, there are a good number of peak implants and there are a good number of titanium implants. And the right implant really depends on the specific problem, the specific patient, and surgeon ergonomics plays a little bit of a role in it. So, you know, if you think about the typical patient and you think about the typical American in the West Coast, Midwest versus the typical Singaporean, they're all very different. And the implants yet are all very generic. And as a surgeon, sometimes there are some implants that work great in the simulator, but when you are working with it in an actual patient, you actually have a potential of damaging the implant. And it's my fault if I damage it, but the ergonomics are off. And so peak is a little bit more challenging in that area compared to a titanium implant. In contrast, if you're dealing around a tumor, even with the most advanced metal artifact suppression, it's not as good as peak. And so I think what you'll really see, and this is why printer press is not owned by a titanium manufacturer or a peak manufacturer, that there's always going to be applications for both. And what may work in the spine is going to be different than the face, which is going to be different than a cardiac problem. And really that's, I think, the, the true value of 3D printing. Because you can now take all the materials that are known to be biocompatible and use geometry and latticing to generate the material properties that you need. You're no longer dealing with just solid bars of titanium versus solid bars of peak. You can now lattice them to change the way that they behave. And, and, you, and you don't have to rely on one material, you know, combination alloys, combination materials. While it might turn out that rough titanium printed surface at the bone interface is still going to be better for fusion. Um, right. But, but it doesn't mean the whole thing has to be titanium. Um, so combination of alloys, combination of materials, um, those types of things are interesting as well, where there's just a little bit of metal that drives bony incorporation, bony fusion, and the rest of it can be another material. Um, that, that it doesn't have to be one. I would just want to add on this is the, um, the example given by Osteopor. So they, they are using actually polymer-based uh, implants. And this is using uh, polycaprolactone or PCL for short. So this, this material itself is uh, bioresolvable. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just quickly add on to Chao Singh's comment. Um, yeah, so I think we, uh, just to answer the question directly on whether polymers can replace metal implants. So as the other speakers have said, it really is case by case. I don't think you can say that there is one material that will fit all applications. I think that's not realistic. Um, it depends on the user's needs, it depends on the anatomical needs, uh, biomechanical needs. Um, so that part of the evaluation really has to be done, uh, if possible, together with a, a community of engineers, surgeons, and, and clinicians, and to determine the correct amount of material that's required. I think the other part that's not really uh, picked up a lot of the time is that if you use polymers, especially those that are bioresolvable, um, your initial assessment of its mechanical properties does not translate to a permanent outcome, right? So in the initial phase, you might say, okay, everything, the mechanical properties, check out the strain, the, the, the stiffness values are comparable. Um, but what happens after the material degrades, um, how it interacts with the tissue and so on and so forth. So I think those are still questions that need to be addressed. Um, I mean, where, where industry can play a role is really to, to uh, deep, really assess this uh, back end, uh, get the designs validated, uh, material properties understood, tissue and growth properties understood before we can better support the application. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Lin Jing. Thank you so much. I think we've uh, got lots more questions to answer, but I think we're really running out of time. We've overrun quite a bit, but this conversation has been so rich and a lot of information has been shared today from the clinicians, from the industry, from the researchers. Uh, so I, I would like to say, uh, a heartfelt thanks to all the speakers, all of you. I think you put in tremendous amount of time and effort to share what you've just shared this morning in Singapore and night in the US. 
So uh, we we'll all have to get on with the rest of the day. Um, and for the, all the attendees, I think we almost had 200 attendees here today, attentively listening all the way till the end. Thank you so much for being with us. And if you have further questions, feel free to write to us and we will answer them as much as we can. And we will connect you with the speakers where possible. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, just as a final thank you for all the speakers and all the participants. Um, so the speakers, may I just ask you to just turn on all your videos and we're going to just do a quick uh, video montage photo shoot. Maybe a thumbs up. Big clap to all of you. You probably can just hear me clapping, but I think everybody is giving you big round of applause so thank you so much guys uh, yeah i want to thank, add my thanks as well thanks uh, for for those in the u.s uh, for staying up so late and those in singapore of course uh for making time on a saturday morning yeah thanks for having us thanks for having right, us. thank you guys and take care Good to see right, you. We'll, we'll, guys soon. We'll, we'll catch up soon thank you very much bye bye, bye for now bye, bye. <laughs> bye.